Welcome people to the supercut of my series on lost slash found rap media. In this series, I detail rap media that no longer exists, is missing, or is no longer available to the general public. I have decided to cut all six volumes of the series together to give you my biggest video ever at nearly three hours. Grab your drinks, snacks, or whatever else you need and let's get to it. But before I get more into the video, I would first like to Thank you guys for coming to see this if you like the content you should like comment and subscribe to help the channel grow also follow my instagram too that would be greatly appreciated you guys can always reach out and just show me some love it's all good let me know where you're tuning in from represent where you're from without further ado let's get into the video So longtime viewers on this channel know that I've discussed this topic multiple times and I debated about making it into a full video, but I decided to throw it in this video since surprisingly a lot of people still don't know about it in depth. I think even if you're at least a casual hip hop fan, then you know that the Wu-Tang Clan really was a force to be reckoned with after they dropped their debut album, Entered the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers in November of 1993. What some people don't know is that sometime after Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers or Method Man's debut album to Cal, the Wu-Tang ran into a huge problem that pretty much ultimately changed rap history forever. RZA, the abbot of the Wu-Tang, had tried to emulate past legends of the music industry after he read up on some books about Stax Records, which is a Memphis record label known for releases from iconic soul artists like the Staple Singers and William Bell. RZA set out to use the models of companies like Motown and Stax to build a sound that would define the Wu-Tang just like Stax and Motown had done in the past. Motown was founded in Detroit, Stax was founded in Memphis, and RZA would start this studio in Staten Island, New York. From what I read, I think the flood happened in 1994, but there is also rumors of there being two floods because Wu-Tang was at an event for Red Bull and Ghostface Killa talks about there being two floods. Based on group member accounts, it appears the first flood happened before the release of Takao and the second flood happened right around the release of Raekwon's debut album only built for Cuban links. RZA would end up doing an interview with Vibe magazine in September of 1996 and he had this to say. When the first Wu album came out, we had all the other albums ready. I had the ish with everybody's name on it and everybody had at least 15 beats in their section. I lost 300 beats in the flood. All that got washed up. RZA estimated that it was around 300 beats, but there is speculation that the number is actually higher. Another member of the Wu-Tang Clan, Raekwon, said in an interview with DJ Booth that it wasn't just RZA's work that was washed away. Raekwon would say, you had true master, you had fourth disciple, they all had different sounds. It was just a collage of organic violins and certain eerie sounds knockers and bangers in beats that was challenging to us. Several other Wu members and affiliated talents lost things in the flood, but one such person who many people think got it the worst was Wu-Tang member Inspector Deck. RZA thinks that if it wasn't for the flood, then Inspector Deck's original debut album would have been up there with the best of them in the Wu-Tang Clan's discography. Inspector Deck was actually on the road when RZA called him and told him about the flood. Deck was obviously stunned. What really sucks is that the original concept of Inspector Deck's album was built around Spider-Man because Ghostface Killer was Iron Man. Me personally, I felt like it would have been a dope concept for an album, especially since Deck was supposed to be one of the first ones to drop a solo album on the Wu-Tang. Deck tried to recreate the vibe of the first album, but it wasn't the same. He tried to put the lyrics he had from the original album on new beats, but it just didn't work. Deck tried everything he could though. In an interview, Deck said, back then we was doing beats on the ASR 10 floppy disk and things like that. Floppy disk got soaked. I tried to salvage it. I took it to a computer place. Nothing could happen. So I lost that first album and had to start all over again. 
Inspector Deck said that the police tried everything that they could and he even ran up a bill of 15 to 16 grand trying to save this album. These floods would ultimately end up changing rap history forever because just imagine if Inspector Deck was one of the first people to drop a solo album from the Wu-Tang and all these beats and equipment didn't end up getting destroyed. Things would be a lot different. Deck would eventually release his debut album Uncontrolled Substance all the way in October of 1999 after delay after delay. Despite all this drama, it still did manage to go gold, but it's unfortunate Deck really never really got his moment to shine in the solo spotlight with all that happened. This was quite a bit of info, but I'm also holding back some because I'm thinking about potentially doing a whole video on this topic and making a alternate timeline of what if, just like I did with Nas' album I Am, which you guys should definitely go check out because I thought that this was a great concept for a video. I'll put a link in the description. In conclusion, unfortunately it looks like we'll never get any of this lost media because it was unfortunately destroyed by floods. Ether, arguably one of the best diss tracks of all time in hip hop history. You can debate that if you want to, but viewers of this channel already know where I stand on that debate. But the version we have today on Nas's fifth studio album, Stillmatic, however, is the third version of the song. Many people already know about the infamous beef between Jay-Z and Nas, so I'm not going to bore you with you having to rehear it for the 500th time, but producer Large Professor did an interview with DJ Vlad and he said Swizz Beats did the original version of Ether. The beat was a lot faster and a lot more noisier. The first version of Ether was deemed too soft and the second version was deemed way too hard. But some lyrics from the version that was way too hard were leaked like the Dame Dash plane crash Aaliyah line Nas had in the song. Steve Stout thought that if that original version of Ether came out, then Nas's career was over, so he wanted him to redo that record. This is what Nas said about the situation during an interview with Funk Flex in December of 2001. When I had the show in Rochester, mm -hmm. The fans haven't heard Ether yet. Okay. So they wanted me to say something. I didn't want to say Ether. They didn't know it. Okay. So I had just thought of something on the spot. And I was mad. I, I didn't really want to say that. I said, rest in peace, Aaliyah. I love you. Instead of you and that plane crash, it should have been. But, you know, that's me speaking out of... At the moment. At the moment, and no disrespect, Aaliyah was a beautiful woman and a queen, so obviously I wasn't dissing her when I said, rest in peace, I love you, because I did love her when she was living, mm -hmm. as well as now. So, I mean, I, I definitely take that back. I take okay. that one back, because this battle was for the records. It's like, you put out your record, and I put out mine. I'm not with all the freestyles at the shows and all that. So you felt TakeOver was trying to end your career? Jay it wasn't in. It wasn't in. It was. His, uh, Jay wasn't having fun. He was. He thought that he had done his thing, and he's the type of brother that want to kick you when you're down. Okay. Basically, I'm not that type of brother. You know, Jay Z is still my brother. At the end of the day, I love him. Mm -hmm. He's a um, good artist, but Ether Burns. So yeah, there's that, and like I said, there has been lyrics floating around from the original disses in which Nas alleges a time, big pun put a gun to Jay-Z's chest along with other things. Ultimately, there were three versions of Ether, and like I said, the first one in diss terms was DM Soft because Nas initially, in his words, didn't really want to go that hard at Jay-Z. Then Nas changed it up with the second one and went like, you know, according to some people, he went too hard at Jay-Z which led him to changing it, and we ultimately got the third version, which is the version that we have today. In conclusion, the first two versions of the track may be out there somewhere. I don't know if it was destroyed, but there is a possibility that those first two versions are out there, but I doubt they will be released willingly because Jay-Z and Nas have since squashed their beef and it just wouldn't be right if let's say like, like that like more vulgar version of Ether surfaced online today. Even though I'm intrigued to hear the first versions of Ether and what Nas actually had to say, I'm actually rather more interested in hearing what the beat sounded like. The beat for Ether that we have today is cool, 
nothing like really really crazy like i think that ron browse definitely did a good job but i think that we can only imagine what a faster version of an ether type record would sound like especially with swizz beats we might not ever hear the full versions of the original versions of ether but at least we have some lyrics that leaked online Producer Ski Beats produced multiple tracks on Jay-Z's debut album, Reasonable Doubt, but what many don't know is that him and Jay-Z had a whole album before Reasonable Doubt along with unreleased material from the late Big L and Camp Low. Ski Beats would trash them after making a switch in his recording technology. In an interview, Ski said, Around the time I was working for Big L, that's when he passed. Nobody heard the songs, and I did all those songs on ADAT audio tapes. Around that time, that's when the whole Pro Tools and the whole computer thing started to come into play. I wasn't even thinking about the future. Any ADATs I had, I just got rid of all my ADATs and went into the computer world. I didn't make copies of anything that we did. Ski Beats would also further elaborate on this by saying this in an interview. That goes for a lot of Jay-Z. Before Reasonable Doubt, we had a whole album that we did that nobody has ever heard. I did it on ADAT, and when I got rid of all the ADAT, I got rid of all the Big L stuff, all the Jay-Z stuff, even unreleased Camp Low music. I wasn't even thinking. Ski admitted that he wasn't even thinking, and he had no idea that he was literally making history. He didn't think that everybody he was working with was going to be something one day, and people would want to hear their earlier music. Now he keeps everything because he never knows what can happen. Due to Ski Beast trashing that Jay-Z stuff, he also trashed some unreleased Big L music. How the Big L collaborations came about as told by Ski Beats was that Big L was from Harlem along with Dame Dash who ended up starting Rockefeller Records with Jay-Z. But that's a whole other series of stories that I mostly covered in my Rockefeller series which you guys should definitely go check out. Link in the description. Dame knew that he had to introduce Jay-Z to Big L so they could have this friendly battle. In an interview with DJ Booth, Ski had this to say. Dame had signed Jay-Z as an artist. Dame and Jay, they used to go around the city and basically battle people. Whoever was the hottest in Queens, Bronx, whatever. Dame would take Jay to these people and have a friendly competition to get Jay's name out at the time. Big L and Jay-Z battled, but according to Ski Beats, he doesn't know who won, but he knows that after the battle, Jay and L became friends because they had that mutual respect for each other. Big L started hanging out with the crew, and Ski eventually had the opportunity to record a couple songs with Big L at his crib while he was staying in Harlem. Ski recollects this was around 1993 or 1994. In conclusion, it looks like we'll never get any of this lost media I talked about due to it being trashed. For those who don't know, Mob Deep is a rap group from Queens, New York who rose to prominence in the mid 90s with their classic second album, The Infamous. But a lot of people don't really consider it to be their second album though, so that should be noted. Some people don't really count Juvenile Hell as their first album, but I digress. Mob Deep's fourth album, Murder Music, was leaked through Napster. Something very similar happened to Nas' album, I Am, which like I said, I did a video on earlier, and Lil' Kim's album, The Notorious K.I.M. Unlike these albums though, much of Murder Music's original content was left intact, but some lyrics and beats did end up changing due to Mob Deep re-recording. Now on the Lost Media Wiki page, it has a link to a webpage which was about Murder Music, and the information was posted in May of 1999, which means this was posted approximately three months before Murder Music was officially released in August of 1999. Now this was released by RNS, which stands for Rabid Neurosis. Once again, hope I'm saying that right. 
rabbit neurosis and apparently they were one of the first mp3 piracy groups and allegedly were responsible for pirating a lot of popular music back in the day obviously this was before my time so maybe people from back then know a lot more about them but if you want to know more about them then i suggest that you look in the description where i'll provide a link to an article where you can read all about them now these are the notes from the project that i'm about to read once again rns brings you the hottest ish around this is a review copy of the forthcoming album by mob deep murder music featuring guest appearances from 8ball, Cormega, Cool G Rap, Big Noid, and Tupac. We're kidding about Tupac. This album was originally slated for an April or May release, but because Mob Deep's label Loud is no longer being distributed by RCA, BMG, the album has been pushed back until mid-summer, while Loud searches for a new distribution deal. In the meantime, RNS has brought you the closest thing to the complete album available. That is, the review copy that has been used as the basis for all the premature reviews you have seen in the source, Blaze, etc. Please note that as a measure to prevent bootlegging doesn't seem to have prevented it. And <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Loud has added a remarkably annoying female voice to every track proclaiming that this is for promotional use only and the like. As well, they have left some tracks complete and faded others out towards the end of the song. All advanced review copies were sent out like this as were advanced copies of Mob Deep's last album, Hell on Earth. And there is nothing RNS can do about it. If you don't want to hear the for promotional use only notice, wait for it to come out in stores. You'll be waiting a while. Enjoy. So after this, let me show you the track list for the official versions of Murder Music. Now let me show you the track list that's on the Lost Media Wiki. I don't know how I'm going to put it on the screen, but you might have to pause it to get a full look on both. But as you can see, the versions are different. The song Deer Park featuring Cormega was renamed to What's Your Poison. White Lines was renamed to Quiet Storm. The Realist Ish featuring Koji Rap was renamed The Realist. And the track that True Ish featuring Chinky originally had kids singing on the hook. I'll now show you the RNS version where there are more differences where they have songs that aren't on either version, such as Mob Coming Through featuring Big Noid, Pow Raps, F That B, and Nobody Likes Me. Another interesting thing that I found was that literally in March of this year, someone posted the unreleased album slash bootleg copy from 1999 of Murder Music. Interestingly enough though, they provided a Dropbox link so you guys can download it if you want it, but I also saw the track list and it appears to be the same one as the one on the Lost Media Wiki. In October of 2020, a Redditor named Jalen Clark 952 uploaded some links to the pre-leaked version of the album on the R Rap subreddit, which is in my mind, I think the person who posted the album on YouTube is the same person or just got it from that person, but they say the exact same thing when they're describing the album's track list, so it might be the same person. In conclusion, I would say the pre-leaked material of this album is either mostly found if not all found. So I was on the Lost Media Wiki looking for things to talk about in this video and I ran across a page talking about an unreleased EP that Mac Miller and Madlib had. For those who don't know, Madlib is a record producer who is widely known for his collaborations with the late MF Doom as Mad Villain, Jay Dilla as J-Lib, and Freddie Gibbs as Mad Gibbs. If you haven't listened to his works, then I definitely recommend that you go check it out because he's definitely up there for my best producers of all time. Mac Miller was a popular rapper from Pittsburgh who had slash has a very dedicated fan base. I don't want to go too deep into the story of Mac Miller in this video, but Madlib and Mac Miller met after Mac recorded the last verse on Freddie Gibbs' Pinata album. 
By early 2015, Madlib had already given Mac a bunch of beats and Mac was recording records. Madlib would end up playing one of Mac Miller's tracks in July of 2016 at a European festival. After this, Mac Miller wanted to do an EP. In 2017, Mac got more beats from Madlib and Mac continued recording. Madlib continued to play a song here and there while he was doing his sets at festivals and word would eventually get back to Mac who was truly excited. Unfortunately, Mac Miller would pass away in September of 2018, leaving any plans remaining on the Madlib project unfinished. Producer Thelonious Martin, I, I hope I'm saying that right, would do an interview in 2019 and he would say this quote, there's plenty of it. When we was working on guidelines, he was always excited about all these other songs. He had this Madlib album called Maclib. I opened up for Madlib in Chicago last summer at Pitchfork. So I'm opening up for Madlib. In about 15, 20 minutes left in my set, Madlib pulls up. Pete Rock walks up as well. So I'm trying to focus on DJ and Madlib gets on and 15 minutes into his set, he just randomly plays a Mac Miller joint. And I turn to him. I'm like, there's more of these, right? He says, oh yeah, there's a whole album. Maclib. What? What? He just kept moving on with his DJ set. If Madlib decides to bless the world with that project, he should. Keep in mind, this article was posted in February of 2019. Literally a day after the article came out, Thundercat, a record producer, a frequent collaborator, and close friend of Mac Miller, posted a tweet saying that he was there when they recorded it and it blew his mind. Also, side note, Thundercat says that he has a full album with Mac Miller as well. In March of 2019 is when an article was posted on Rapcats where we would receive a little bit more information on the project. At the end of the article, it says that there was no official plans to release this EP. Since March of 2019, only a few recordings of the collaborations between Mac Miller and Madlib have surfaced online. One piece of audio features Thundercat and was first played by Madlib in San Diego. The second one is a longer song over two minutes long and was played by Madlib during a DJ set in July of 2019. People don't know if the second song was attended for the EP or not. The titles of these songs, if they ever had any, are not known as well. In conclusion, I don't know if this EP between Mac Miller and Madlib will ever come out. It would be dope to hear a Madlib and Mac Miller EP, but with Mac's passing, I just don't know if it will ever see an official release. And I mean, like, we know who has it, so it's technically not lost as if we, like, can't find it because, like, we know that it exists and we know who has it. At one point, it was intended for public consumption, and we even got a couple glimpses at this project. But unfortunately, we will never know if we will ever hear this project in full. I still remember vividly when I first heard Pusha T drop the diss track, The Story of Adidon, in May of 2018. I just remember looking at the cover and I already knew this was about to be history. I played the track and I remember I had to keep pausing it and rewinding it back like it was like a freaking smack battle. Like, yo, like I wish like I could have watched like, yo, I wish I could have dropped a couple Don DeMarcos. Pusha T was indeed speaking to Drake's soul. When Pusha T said it was going to be a surgical summer and that this was pretty much the beginning, I was so ready to hear what Drake had to say in response to this diss. I've gotten a ton of requests to cover the Pusha T Drake beef, but there's already a ton of videos covering it and I thought to add this to this video to somewhat please those people who've been asking for it. But back to the story though, and yeah, after the story of Adidon, I like many people awaited a response from Drake. Would Drake respond? How would he respond? What dirt did he have on Pusha T and Kanye? This was all questions going through my head. After the story of Adidon, Drake did not officially reply with the diss. 
there were talks of Drake having a diss record pretty much ready to go, but music mogul Jay Prince didn't want Drake to release it because he thought Drake was sitting on a career-ending Pusha T and Kanye diss track. In an interview, Jay Prince had this to say about the track. The ingredients was overwhelming. I knew for a fact that it would have been bad for Kanye and my man. It just wouldn't be good. It's beyond music at that point. It's going to affect the livelihood. It's going to interfere with his whole lifestyle from that moment. In regards to if it would leak one day, Jay Prince said that Drake gave him his word that it wouldn't. Now my opinion on this track of if it would have ended careers, my answer is a no. I just think that Drake was going to say that he had slept with Kim Kardashian or something to that extent. Like which, like, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into all that. But yeah, that's what I think that like was allegedly in this track. I don't get the point of saying that you got this career ending track, but we the public get to never ever listen to it and like that like I don't we don't even know if it's true. Me personally, I just find it weird how Jay Prince shielded this song during the Pusha Drake beef, but this type of stuff didn't happen during the Drake Meek beef. Now that Drake had a worthy opponent, no disrespect Meek. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sounded childish. I, that wasn't even in the script. That was that was just ad lib. That's crazy. But <laughs> no disrespect me. Like I mess with Philly big time. Like if you if you want this channel, like you know that I mess with Philly big time. But Meek was Meek was tripping. But like Pusha was definitely not Meek. He was not playing around. Like and Pusha was applying that pressure. So now that Pusha was applying this pressure, you know things was a little bit different. I'm just calling it how I see it, and I don't have a problem with Jay Prince either. Like Jay Prince, like I, I want to live in Texas one day. If you've seen this, it's Jay Prince, I want to live in Texas one day. But there's just something that that's just something that I was just thinking. Anyways. While I was doing research, I came across this Reddit post from some months back explaining a theory about the diss track. Shout out to user it is what it is boy on Reddit. I'll put what he said on the screen so you guys can read it and you can pause the video to fully read it. The theory alleges that a couple years ago on the Kanye to the forum, a user that goes by the name of 600 not nice claimed to be a cousin of producer Vinyls and said Drake's diss track against Pusha T and Kanye West is titled Truth Be Told, which was produced by Boy Wonder, 40 and Vinyls. In Drake's Rap Radar interview, that user's claim about Vinyls matched what Drake was saying and that it was produced by Vinyls. I'll even put up the post that the user made on the Kanye to the forum so you guys can see and he even said that he got word that the track was confirmed and people waited in anticipation but the track ended up never coming out. The person from the reddit post says that there could have been a possibility that the person was pretending to be Vinyl's cousin because it was never confirmed but another piece of strong evidence that the person was telling the truth are on some bars on Drake's song Omerta that are directed towards Kanye West. The bars are borderline dangerous, approach with caution. I plan to buy your most personal belongings when they're up for auction. Man, truth be told, I think about it often. The petty king, the overseer of many things. In conclusion, I don't know if this track will ever get leaked or released. Drake swore to Jay Prince that it wouldn't release, which leads me to think that the only way that the public will hear this track is if it somehow did leak. The Pusha T Drake beef has died down a lot. I mean, like, Pusha still be throwing jabs at Drake. I think that a lot of people are waiting to see what Drake does on his album Certified Lover Boy. I also know Pusha T has an album coming out soon, so we could potentially see this war reignite again this year. I think this alleged diss track definitely classifies as lost media because it was at one point intended for public consumption but things happened and it was deliberately made not available to the public. Now the status of where the diss track is I have no clue if it was completely scrapped put on a flash drive somewhere or whatever but we got from multiple accounts that this alleged track existed. My guess is it probably is out there somewhere. Now, a lot, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot of people have hit me up 
just to do a video on 3-6 Mafia in general. I mean, like, the, that's probably, like, the most requested video I have ever got. But, yeah, but I will tell you that this week you guys will be getting a 3-6 Mafia video. But while I was doing research for that 3-6 Mafia video, I was scrolling on the Lost Media Wiki, and I found an article about an unreleased 3-6 Mafia album called Laws of Power. The album was initially supposed to release in August of 2009, according to an article in Billboard. About the album, member of 3-6 Mafia, Juicy J, would say that the album was going to be about 20 songs and that the album was 90% done. The article also says that at that time, there were two planned lead singles with the mainstream targeted single and the song Shake My, which was a Rodney Darkchild Jenkins produced track featuring singer Kalina. Sorry if I butchered that, but but she's from Diddy's group, Dirty Money. And there was supposed to be a gangster track, which was a new version of the song Lil Freak Uh Uh Uh, which featured on Juicy J's solo album, Hustle Till I Die, which came out in June of that year. The article would also state that they recorded a techno-flavored song called Feel It, which was produced by Tiesto and features Flo Rida and Sean Kingston, as well as having songs with Kevin Rudolph and Dr. Luke. Man, this sounds like an interesting project. But DJ Paul would also say that despite rumors at that time that Lord Infamous had not rejoined 3-6 Mafia and did not appear on Laws of Power, DJ Paul was also asked about the significance behind the title of the album, and he would say, Because we feel 3-6 Mafia has always been known for starting trends. Songs like Sipping Some Syrup, Riding Spinners, Tear the Club Up, always set trends and started little things. Our songs were like the law of those trends. On this album, each song represents a different law and what we feel you need to be doing at that time. The article would end off saying that 3-6 Mafia hoped to hold industry listening parties for the album later that month and at the time was planning an extensive promotional tour prior to the album's release. Once it came out, they hoped to hit the concert stage, but at that time, no dates had been determined. Now, there's a second Billboard article in which that was released in January of 2010, while that other one was released in August of 2009. In this article, 3-6 Mafia would refer to that song, Feel It, with Tiesto as the most different song that they've ever made in their lives. And I also found out that the song, Little Freak, featured Webby, which I like totally forgot about that song, like when it comes to 3-6 Mafia. Totally, for, that, that used to be my joint back in the day. Yo, my dad was a big 3-6 Mafia fan, so heard that song all the time, super duper fire. But along with Webby, we also got more insight on some other people who were supposed to be featured on the album, which were Tech 9 and Project Pack. This second Billboard article would say that the album was supposed to come out in March of 2010. Time went by and the album didn't come out, but Juicy J would do an interview in 2011 and he would say, we've been doing so much work on this album that I can't even say when it's dropping. We've recorded over 75 songs. We will release something hopefully this summer, but it will be this year. Time went by again and it wouldn't come out. DJ Paul did an interview in 2020 and he was asked if Laws of Power was ever going to be released. And he said, I doubt it. So although we never got the whole album, we do have a few tracks that was meant to be on it. Both Feel It and Lil Freak are fire and like, I, I cannot lie. Like, it's crazy to see that Feel It with Tiesto has over 55 million views on YouTube alone. It makes me think what 3-6 Mafia could have did if they ventured more into that sound and that lane at that time. By the way, if I end up showing some cover art of Laws of Power, I don't know if that was confirmed to be it. Because on the wiki, it says that it was the possible cover art for it. But man, if it really was the cover art, yo, like that is super sick in my opinion. In conclusion, if we're holding DJ Paul to his word, we'll probably never get this album, which really sucks and makes me put into perspective of how much DJ Paul and Juicy J collectively have of unreleased material from themselves, together, and 3-6 Mafia throughout the phases of the group. 
they're sitting on literal history. Like, it's insane when you think about it. And even when you look at DJ Paul's classic volume series. At one point, this album, Laws of Power, was intended for public consumption, but it got delayed multiple times, resulting in it possibly never coming out, leaving fans years after the fact wondering what could have been. Well, this will be Nas' second appearance in this series, and don't worry, this definitely won't be his last, because Nas actually has a bunch of lost media and actually might be in the next volume again, but I'm still making that decision to have this man on their three consecutive volumes. But once again, this is another thing that I read on a lost media wiki that I found very interesting. So basically, The Death of Escobar is an unreleased Nas album that was supposed to come out in 2001 and was in reference to Nas's alternative persona of Nas Escobar, who is also in reference to the famous Paulo Escobar, but I figured that people would put two and two together and make that correlation. But the article will go on and say that much information about this album is unknown and pictures of this purported album had surfaced through the internet for a decade and the album even had a barcode provided as well, which meant that there was planned distribution for the album. The article also says that hip hop heads debated for years whether this album went on to be Stillmatic, which went on to be released in December of 2001, a canceled concept album, or was a fan made fake. In 2014, on a blog called The Lost Tapes, a person who goes by the name of CL8A7 would reveal that in fact, this album was real and was intended to be the first part of the album Stillmatic, but was canceled before it was released and instead re-released and retitled as The Lost Tapes in 2002. In the Lost Wiki article, it says that in the year 2000, Nas started working on his new album, and in early 2001, an email message was sent to people who were subscribed to Sony Music Street Team UK's email newsletter. This was the email allegedly said. The forthcoming Nas album is on hold at the moment. Here's the latest plan. Nas wants to release Death of Escobar first, with Stillmatic to follow. Death of Escobar is the bootleg slash sessions project. The project will feature the track listing below, plus three new tracks. This track listing could and probably will change. The three new tracks will explain Escobar's death. No music has been discussed or recorded for Stillmatic. In a best case scenario, the album will be released in June 2001. From this email, we can pretty much put together that Death of Escobar was going to be a sort of introduction type album that explained the death of Nas's alter ego, Nas Escobar. Stillmatic was going to be this rebirth rebranding of Nas, if you will. And then the article brings up that around this time, Vibe Magazine actually reviewed the album before it was set to be released. I'll try to put up the article on the screen so you guys can read it. So the article goes, with 1994's Illmatic, Nasty Nas's intricate street lyrics drew him comparisons to Cool G Rap and Rakim. His music also got respect from those people in the ghetto who needed a knowledgeable voice to expose their struggles and reassure them that there was hope for the future. Nas's well-received first CD was followed by three more successes. It was written, I Am and Nasradamus, and a new Nas Escobar persona, a generic Moet sipping mogul in white fur and iced out accessories. While his post-Illmatic work sold millions, true fans pinned for Nasty Nas. Instead of the elaborate skits and soulless rhymes of his work as bootlegs and remixes of D.O.E., are old school nasty Nas. Like Ice Cube's classic jacking for beats, the foulness finds Nas spitting over four dynamic beats. The slick Rick flavored rise and fall details one man's epic struggles in the rap game. For Papa was a player, Nas tells a sad story of his father's misogyny. The seamless blending of old and new material continues on tracks like Tales from the Hood about murder happy drug dealers and your mouth got you in it. While bootlegging kept fans away from much of this material, DOE is well worth the wait. So as you can see, they heard the album and thought that it was well worth the wait and even listed some of the songs off of the album and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself but they mentioned the song Papa Was A Player and that ended up being on Lost Tapes. Another interesting thing the article talked about was how Nas had a song called The Foulness, where he rapped over four dynamic beats and then had a Slick Rick inspired song in Rise and Fall. 
One of the last things I want to touch on in the Lost Media Wiki article is that it says that a bootleg has existed on Discogs since 2011, 2012 with only a speculated track list. It says that this isn't an authentic copy and that it seems that studio copies for the project have not turned up. It's currently unknown how many variants exist or if any bootlegs might be the real copy. Originally, I was going to end the segment at that, but then I got curious and I ended up wanting to find out more. So I found this blog that the wiki was referring to and I found that it had some key information on there. So the person who made the post said that a guy called Cairo or Cairo kid, once again, hopefully I'm saying that right, who knew him, gave him key information that would reveal that Death of Escobar was in fact a proper album that was completed and scrapped really close to its original release date. The writer would also go on to say that the truth behind the project is that it's more of an early version of the compilation album The Lost Tapes. The person then talks about the Vibe article and the email that was sent out and then they plug in a link to a mailing group where I managed to find a track list which keep in mind like as the email said could and probably would have changed. I'll post the track list and this is interesting to say the least. According to the Lost Media Wiki, tracks 1, 5, 6, 7, 12, 13, and 15 would appear on the Lost Tapes, with a few having altered names and tracks 7 and 13 being only available in Japan and other markets. Another note they had for this album was that this was supposed to be 50 Cent's intended debut on a major album on the song Projects Too Hot, but that song would appear as Too Hot on 50 Cent's debut official solo mixtape in 2002, Guess Who's Back. Notice how I said debut official mixtape for those who might try to fact check me on that. Also, the song Papa Was A Player was going to be one of Kanye's first major productions, but the interesting thing about it is that Papa Was A Player was originally supposed to be on the original version of Nas's album I Am which was released in 1999. Kanye first was buzzing when he produced Benny Siegel's song The Truth in 2000, and he would really explode when he produced Jay-Z's song Izzo when it came out in 2001. In conclusion, the original track listing and bootlegs have been found for this project, but the original copies of Death of Escobar remain lost. I got requested to do this segment by my boy Niall. Recent viewers of this channel know who I'm talking about, so if you know, you know. Uh, but he recommended that I talk about this, and it's definitely interesting. Now, personally, RP everyone that has died that I have talked about in this video. But man, like when I found out that Kobe died, I was just like in shock, man. I was like mid rehearsal doing this thing for my fraternity, and I'm with some sorority girls, and they told us that he died. And I, it was it was just crazy, man. Like it was a crazy day for me that I will never forget. This long lost Kobe album, though, proves true to the age old saying. Rappers want to be ball players, and ball players want to be rappers, or something like along those lines. Like it might be vice versa, but I don't know. But I mean, like you have like Shaq, Allen Iverson, Damian Lillard, Ron Artest. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Speaking of Ron Artest, yo, his song on 2K11, fire. Like I don't care what anyone says. Like that might be the best song by a basketball player ever. Like fight me. Like I do not care. Like that, that song is fire. But, <laughs> but anyways. But earlier this year, an album Kobe made in 2000 had been fully recovered and leaked. This album contained features from Tyra Banks, Destiny's Child, Nas, even though he sampled his voice, 50 Cent, Black Thought, Beanie Siegel, and others. That's a pretty stacked lineup. Like, I can't even lie. Like, <laughs> I can't even lie. But mind you, I said earlier in the Nas segment, this was not the 50 Cent that we know today. This was 50 Cent pre Get Rich or Die Trying. 50 was originally supposed to appear on Nas's Death of Escobar, and that was originally going to be like his first big appearance on a major, major album like that. But like, if he was supposed to be on Kobe's album back in 2000, like, does that count? Like, as a first, like, because Kobe kind of, you know. But but back to the topic at hand, though, and basically as to why Kobe would record an album, well. It apparently started after his, at the time, Laker teammate Shaq 
found success off the court with music. I think most people forget, or at least my generation doesn't know, that Shaq actually went platinum and, and gold, I believe. But Steve Stout, the former president of Sony's Urban Music at the time, helped Shaq launch his rap career, and he would do the same for Kobe. So in 1999, Steve Stout signed Kobe along with his rap group. I'm about to butcher the hell out of this, but Cheezaw, 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 I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put, I just spell it on the screen. I don't know how they say, I don't know how you say that, but I don't know, but they got a deal. Now with this deal came having to relocate the group from LA to New Jersey. After three weeks of Kobe training on the court and recording late night raps at the Hit Factory, this project titled Visions was born. Now, Kobe released a debut single for the project titled K.O.B.E., which featured Tyra Banks. However, this didn't live up to the expectations Columbia Records had, so the project was quietly dropped without the entire album being released. This happened to be after Kobe released the single for the album on NBA All-Star Weekend, and he would go on to perform the song live at the game. Kobe still dabbled in rap after this, but ultimately, no album ever came. Rap legend LL Cool J did do an interview where he recalled a memory of Kobe playing him this album. And he said, we talked about rap. He played me this gangsta rap album. And I was like, Kobe, come on, dog. That's not what you need to be doing. He played me that album. We're sitting in a parking lot. I was confused. I was there like, what are we doing? You got endorsements. What are you doing? It had to be the funniest moment of my life listening to him do gangsta rap. In conclusion, this album has now been leaked and found and is available on the internet for you to enjoy. This is another entry from the Lost Media Wiki and I found this rather interesting. Also, side note, sorry if this audio might sound a little different because I didn't record where I normally record and this section was a last minute addition for you fans who like my videos to be a little longer. So basically, some backstory behind this Easy e story is that around 1992-ish, NWA would break up. Ice Cube would leave around 1989 and Dr. Dre would leave around 1992. While Ice Cube was pursuing a solo career after leaving NWA, there was some distance between him and the remaining members of NWA. What's interesting though is that when Ice Cube went solo, he still wanted Dre to produce his beats and here is what Cube said about it in an interview. So when I went solo, I was like, I wanted Dr. Dre to do America's Most Wanted, but Jerry Heller vetoed that. So since he vetoed that stuff, and I'm pretty sure Easy e didn't want Dre to do it, but Dre did want to do it. We gotta put that on record. Dre wanted to do my record, but it was just too crazy with the breakup of NWA. So as you can see, Ice Cube said that Dre wanted to make some stuff with him, but Jerry Heller and also allegedly Easy e didn't want Dre to do it. To skip ahead a little bit, N.W.A. would drop the 100 Miles and Running EP in August of 1990. On this EP, there was some jabs at Ice Cube. On the title track for the album, 100 Miles and Running, Dr. Dre, of all people, was throwing shots at Ice Cube, even after what I just said Ice Cube said. There's also some other notable disses on the EP. The fourth track on the EP, as an example, but in December of 1990, Ice Cube would release the Kill at Will EP, and at the end of the song Jackin' for Beats, he mentions 100 Miles and Running. The next year, in May of 1991, N.W.A. released their sophomore album, and on the track Always Into Something, Dr. Dre sent another shot at Ice Cube. Then to skip ahead a little bit further, Ice Cube would drop his sophomore album, Death Certificate, in October of 1991. On this album, people have said that Ice Cube has one of the best disses of all time with No Vaseline, where he slaughtered N.W.A. In an interview, Ice Cube had this to say. I think Dre had just finished The Chronic and he was about to put out Doggy Style with Snoop. We had a chance to really talk, and we never really talked about the song, you know? We still haven't talked about the song. I mean, dang. They was disrespectful too. If you really think about America's Most Wanted, I never even mentioned NWA on that record at all. 
I was all about what I was doing with PE and the Bomb Squad and Chuck D and them. So for them to diss me on their EP, 100 Miles and Running, you know what I mean? I kind of threw a little jab with Jacket for Beats at the end. And then they came with another, like, a couple little disses. I said, okay, man, I'm tired of this. I'm going to end this real quick. We're going to set it all the way off. So that's when I wrote No Vaseline, recorded it. I put it on that Cinderella track, that Dana Dane track. We flipped it and it became a smash. And I didn't know that at the time, they was already fragmented, breaking up anyway. So that just, I guess, knocked him down like bowling pins. So Dr. Dre would release the second single off of his album, The Chronic, which was Dre Day. And the single was released in May of 1993. He would have some shots at Ice Cube and Easy e on the track. And Easy e would respond with the legendary diss track, Real MF and G's in August of 1993. As we heard from Ice Cube earlier, between the releases of The Chronic and Snoop Dogg's album Doggy Style is when he finally really got a chance to talk to Dr. Dre. The weird thing about the Eazy-E and Ice Cube situation though is that there are no release tracks in which Eazy-E directly disses Ice Cube like Dr. Dre did for Eazy-E for instance. It's alleged that Eazy-E decided not to release what has been reported to be an entire Ice Cube bashing EP because the two have had reconciled before Easy's untimely death. In 2011, a YouTuber released what was purported to be part of a lost song titled When the Ice Crumbles, but DJ Yella had this to say about it in an interview. I've seen that. That's from an interview and they just put it on some track or something. I've heard some of it and thought, nah. I don't click on anything that's dissing somebody at all. I just keep scrolling past and I don't get into that stuff. Well, I did some research and I found a Reddit post where someone posted what seems to be a DM of an exchange that they had with DJ Speed. DJ Speed says that there was no EP or album. It was one song that would never be released and all the rumors about an album are lies. So basically, according to DJ Speed, it was one track and it will likely never get released, which makes complete sense. It looks like this track will forever be lost. Man, the Ghetto Boys mind playing tricks on me. Definitely up there for one of the best rap songs of all time for sure. And that's not even a debate. The Ghetto Boys were a legendary rap group out of Houston, Texas. And about the song, one of the group's members, Scarface, said this in an interview. Mind playing tricks on me was one of the numerous songs I wrote and produced myself. There were three verses. My first two verses, the verse that Bill rapped, was my own third verse. It was a record I originally recorded for my solo album, but nobody wanted that song. I swear, nobody. Willie D didn't think the record would work, but he wrote a verse to it anyway after Jay had done his research on this song. He found some people who were really feeling it. He wanted everybody to rap on it. It became a Ghetto Boys record. This was said in an interview in 2010, I believe, and around 2016, Scarface would make an annotation on Genius underneath the song saying, I wish I could find the original version of this song, the one I first recorded. I gave it to a buddy of mine named Little Silver, and he died. That's the only copy of My Mind Playing Tricks on Me with every verse by me. Somebody has that effing tape somewhere. It's me all by myself. As of today, it hasn't been found, and it's a true shame that it hasn't, because it would be real dope to hear Scarface all over the song, and I bet like a lot of people still want to hear it. I mean, like, who wouldn't? Like, like I said, like it's one of the best rap songs of all time. So why wouldn't you like not want to hear like the early version of the song? In conclusion, this media is lost due to the circumstances Scarface just said, and it's a real shame. I've actually gotten a few requests to touch on this topic and it's actually really interesting because like, I've been wanting to talk about Hammer, you know, on my channel for like a little minute because like I feel like, I, I don't know how my generation feels about Hammer, but they need to definitely like, you know, like get up on Hammer for 100% because like Hammer was definitely, people could not front, Hammer was that dude when he was out. This man had a freaking, this man had all the stuff that was cool before it was cool. This man had Pepsi endorsements. This man had his own freaking tv he had his own cartoon like this man this man hammer was like bro he was everything you know what i mean i don't know how people feel about him i know people back in the day you know they, they mess with hammer 
You know what I mean? And I just hate how his career got overshadowed because, you know, the whole bankruptcy, you know, broke thing and stuff like that. But anyways, let's just get to the point. And so by the time MC Hammer came to Death Row Records in 1995, he was in a weird part of his career because his smash album, Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him, came out in 1990. Then Too Legit to Quit still did pretty well after that, but obviously it's kind of hard to recapture what Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him did. Then he didn't drop an album until three years later when he dropped The Funky Headhunter, and it did still manage to go platinum, but as you can see, every album after Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him, he was starting to sell less and less. Tupac would also sign with Death Row in 1995 as well, and MC Hammer and Tupac really became good friends, and there are numerous pictures of them hanging out together. In regards to why Hammer signed with Death Row, he said this in an interview. Should called me asking me would I like to join the family. Of course, with the marketing machine that Death Row has and the way that Suge knew how to get behind an artist and push his music and also the fact that Suge Knight was and still is CEO of what the so-called insiders would call a gangster rap label wanted to put MC Hammer on his label. Well, what do they say? It said what I had always said, that music is music. This interview was done in 1997, by the way, because we all know what happened with Death Row. Like, we all know what happened with Death Row. But like I said, Tupac and Hammer would hit it off, and this is what Hammer had to say about Tupac. I really had genuinely brotherly love for Pac when I became part of the Death Row family. I had told him about a song I wanted to do. It was off the Ohio player Skin Tight. I wanted to call it Too Tight. Before I could get to the studio, Tupac had gotten up early that morning, went to the studio, called in the background singers, laid down the background, and wrote a rap. He wanted me to rap, and it was done. He immediately embraced his partner from the town. And in the coming months after this track, more work was done on MC Hammer's album that was supposed to be called the Too Tight album. There's also another song called Unconditional Love, and this is what Hammer had to say about it in an interview. That's what Tupac gave me. That's what he gave to me that he wanted to give to the world because his thing was these are things that need to be said and I don't get to say them. I need somebody to say them, so I want you to say them. You can easily look up Tupac's version of the song and it's truly amazing. It's a true testament to how great him and his music was. It's also interesting to note that Hammer and Pac had a lot of plans together and one of those plans was writing and making movies together. Tupac also had ideas to do a tour on the west coast with high schools only and the only students that could attend the concert had to have at least a C average. Tupac asked Hammer and Snoop Dogg to join him. Unfortunately though, in 1996, Tupac would pass away and then Hammer would leave the label not that long after. Also, I know that I did label this segment the Tupac and MC Hammer unreleased album, but that's simply mainly for titling. This was a MC Hammer album, but Tupac was heavily involved with it. In conclusion, it looks like we have some recordings that were probably intended for the album, but ultimately no album ever came and it's a shame because if it was supposed to release at that time, it would have definitely sparked energy back into Hammer's career now that he was on a monster label, had the guidance of Tupac, had top notch producers around him along with numerous other things. But obviously when Pac died, all this kind of went down the drain and then we started to see the decline of Death Row with everybody leaving but it's always cool to like speculate and think about like what could have happened but yeah like it's a shame that like like i said like we have some tracks that were probably intended for the album but the whole album or multiple tracks intended for this album might be floating around somewhere so i think that it's safe to label this as partially lost Now I told myself that I wasn't going to do a video about Cameron on my channel for a minute, mainly because I feel like I already have done so many videos on him, but ever since I've done the first volume in this Lost Last Found rap media series, people have been asking me to clarify what exactly happened to this, what seems to be like mythical old boy remix. Definitely one of the most requested things for me to discuss in this series. But anyways, let's get to the story. So basically, when they were on Rockefeller together, they never really got along. 
Whenever I discuss this, I always note that Jay never held Cam back because I believe in order to do something, I believe that Cam needed like six or seven signatures and Jay was one of them and he always signed off. But things between the two would heat up when this happened. I'll play the clip. When they first got there, it was a little, it was a, it was a little tricky. Rockefeller gave the diplomats a label and we gave state property a label. But Cam was moving a little quicker than Beans. I told Beans, Beans, I'm going to make you a vice president. Cam, I'm going to make you a vice president. But the way a boss does, Cam went to the radio, quick, just when we were discussing it, and told the whole world. We hadn't even negotiated it. So now, everybody on the label, I'm talking about everybody, is like, what, I got to ask him for videos now? They was Dame friends, so I guess the tension between Jay and Dame came. They was trying to give Cam a vice president position or something like that. And Vito was out of town, so when Vito flew in, he was like, whoa, what's going on? We was cool. Like, they probably a dipset got along. We was all coming from the same place, so it wasn't no tension between us. We always were bosses. Now we on Rockefeller. We like, what do you do? It was like, nah, Dame, like a big brother. We going crazy in this shit. You can't tell us no. Who gonna tell us no? We went dumb in Rockefeller. So yeah, that's that side of the story. But to circle back a little bit, old boy went on to be a smash hit, reaching number four on the Billboard Hot 100. This is what happened when it was time to do the remix. Fucking Kanye sells us a few beats. We watching the BET Awards. Jay Z about to perform his new single, and he gets up there, and it's the beat that we brought from Kanye. Which would now be H to the Izzo. So now we steaming. Just Blaze had the beats laying around, so we in the studio every day. And Just Blaze plays the old boy beat. The old boy shit, that was J Reckon. Can't shut the fuck up. We took that. That was ours. Strong arm. Good looking, Just Blaze. This is what Just Blaze had to say about the song in an interview. There was drama about that song being Jay's originally and that they stole Jay's beat or whatever. It totally wasn't like that. Originally, the beat was much faster. I made it as an up-tempo record for Bleak, but he turned it down. I reworked it and slowed it down, but he still wasn't really feeling it. Jay walked in and heard it and was like, yo, that's serious. But he wasn't working on the album at the time. He had just finished Blueprint 2, so he was like, hold that for me. There's a million beats like that. Jay said the same thing about Pump It Up. Sometimes he'll hear a beat and like it, but he won't like it a year later when he's making an album. Jay was originally supposed to be on the Old Boy remix, but Cameron deleted his verse. Joel Santana, a member of Dipset, had this to say in an interview about the situation. We walked in the studio and Jay said, I got a surprise for y'all. At this point, we was wondering why he didn't want to jump on records that he could have jumped on already. So old boy is already out of this world, getting probably like 10,000 spins. So we walked up into the studio room and we're like, what's the surprise? And young guru pulls up old boy with the Jay-Z verse. On top of the Jay-Z verse, he's dissing Nas. Cam made Guru erase the verse to the point where Cam told Guru, you better erase that, I don't ever want to hear that. While writing this script, I completely forgot that I made a video on Cam and Jay-Z's beef a while ago, and it covers a good amount of it. I'll put a link in the description, but I think since then I have drastically improved, but that video fills in a lot of the other stuff that was going on regarding the situation. Um, Jay-Z telling an engineer to delete Cam's verse on the original version of Petey Crack's One for Petey Crack, the fiasco behind the Izzo beat. So there's so much more regarding everything, but this is Cam's version of what happened. We stole the beat from Just Blaze. We took it. He didn't want to give it to us. Jewel's just convinced me to take the stuff from him. It was a CD in the studio and it was Just Blaze on there. And the dude just was like, don't take my beats. And we's like, we're going to take your beat. And we took it and put it on the radio and it was hot. Just was actually really mad that we did that. That's my man now though, but he was really mad about that stuff. What's interesting is that in an interview that Just Blaze did, he said producer Young Guru called him and said that Cam was about to hop on the old boy beat and Just Blaze said go ahead. Before Just Blaze could get back to the studio, Cam had already taken the record to the radio before Just could even hear it. 
This obviously clashes with Cam's side of the story from the aspect of Cam quote unquote stealing the song. Just Blaze said that the tension behind the song, at least between him and Cam, was the publishing aspect because Cam rushed to put it on radio and didn't clear the samples and things of that matter. Just Blaze said that Cam told him years ago that he was just worried about being hot and not really thinking about the business aspect of things. Now to revert it back to Jay-Z, I mean like Just Blaze said that Jay forgot that Just gave him the beat first and he slept on it and it eventually landed in the hands of Cam. To this day, we've never heard the version of Cam and Jay on Old Boy together. It really makes me wonder how much rap history could have changed if Cam and Jay were actually cool when they were on Rockefeller and if Rockefeller didn't implode. We'll probably never hear the original verse Jay-Z had on the Old Boy beat. Ah, man, good old Ghostface Killer, one of my favorite members from one of my favorite groups of all time, which is Wu-Tang. Towards the late 90s, there was some people feeling like the Wu-Tang was losing steam as a group and even some individuals within the group. I would say after Wu-Tang Forever, things were definitely different for the group. Number-wise, they still managed to do pretty well, but their solo projects and even group projects after 1997 just didn't have that essence of what Liquid Swords, Only Built for Cuban Links, or Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers had. A lot of people felt like Ghostface was holding the group down with his releases being met with critical acclaim. Ghost released his debut album Iron Man in October of 1996, selling 156,000 copies in his first week while peaking at number two on the Billboard 200. It also received four mics in the source as well at the time. That's something to note. Ghost would then follow it up with the release of his sophomore project, Supreme Clientele, which released in February of 2000, peaking at number seven on the Billboard 200 while selling 134,000 copies in its first week. This album would receive four and a half mics from the source, and now it was time for Ghost to release his third solo studio album. By the way, go check out my video I did on Supreme Clientele a while back, which you guys should definitely go check out. Link in the description. The next year in 2001, Ghost would release the album Bulletproof Wallets in November of that year. And as some people may know, the album that we have today wasn't how the project originally was planned. Things like sample clearance issues, label politics, and things like lost sample sources deeply affected the album. Allegedly, the story goes that Ghostface would hand in the album to Epic Records at the beginning of 2001 and was supposed to be a great follow-up to his previous albums Iron Man and Supreme Clientele. However, upon turning in the album, Epic Records ended up switching the track sequencing and deleting tracks like The Sun and The Watch. From what I researched, RZA couldn't find the original record he had sampled for the song The Sun, so that's why that was deleted. It's a shame because the song is actually really, really great, and I'm about to play a snippet for you guys. Look at the sun, so pretty today. It's so bright and so smashing. Lasting helps out the grass and smile when it's morning time. Last night I wrote three rhymes. I woke up to see the sun shining. God is my witness in scriptures and pictures. The sun kiss scrumptious, sun is nutritious. It makes me want to climb, take a bite out of shine. This little light of mine. In an interview, Ghost said that RZA got high and couldn't find the loop at all and where it was sampled from, so that's why it wasn't on the album. This also ultimately left Slick Rick to not be on the album since he was on the song. The song Flowers ended up having a sample change, and in my opinion, I prefer the older version a lot better. The verses are still the same, but things just seem off with the album version. I don't know about what an average Ghostface fan thinks of Bulletproof Wallets, but I think this album has a Nas I Am situation written all over it. People think both are good, but in comparison to what those two respective albums could have been is insane. The original version of Bulletproof Wallets did get four and a half mics in the source as well, just a note. Here's a picture of that, and yet it's unfortunate what happened, and tracks like The Sun, the watch and the original version of Flowers can be found on the internet. The track listing is where the issue comes in. Now Ghost is no stranger to having, I would like to say, an off track listing because he had the same problem with Supreme Clientele, I believe. 
The track listing on the back of the retail CD originally had a different track list than the actual CD, including songs like The Sun and clean vinyl promos for radio was also sent out by Epic Records. According to my research, an original track listing of the album has never been properly confirmed, but we do have some of the songs I mentioned earlier. I put up a track list of what OG Bulletproof wallets could have potentially looked like. I've looked around and multiple people have posted the same exact track list. With that said though, I really do want to ask you guys, what do you guys think of Ghostface's run with his first three albums? Did he go three for three or could Bulletproof Wallets had been better if the original version was released? Do you think it would have changed the direction of Ghostface's career or even Wu-Tang's career at that time? It's always something to think about and I posted that I was going to talk about this album on the community tab on my YouTube page and I saw that mad people messed with the album and I remember people calling it a classic and people telling me how it got them through college. I really really like the cover to this album though for some reason definitely one of my favorite album covers of all time and I remember seeing it as a kid and seeing like the robe that Ghost had on and like I, as a kid like I, yo like I wanted one one day but in conclusion, like I said, an original track listing of the album has never been properly confirmed, but we do have songs like The Sun, The Watch, and the original version of Flowers. Many people watching this video are probably well aware or know a little something about 50 Cent's story and how he came in the rap game. You might also have lived through how truly crazy it was in 2003 when 50 Cent would drop his classic debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying. Truly groundbreaking album, and I think it's near diamond status if it's not already, so give it some more time, and it will, but man, it's well deserved, I must say. There was so much history behind this album and a lot of tracks on the album, but today we're talking about the fourth track on the album, Many Men. This was the third single for the album and the song details 50 Cent being shot nine times a couple years before this album came out. I really like this song a lot and you can feel what 50 is saying and feel the emotion. What a lot of people don't know about the history behind this song is that it actually involves Nas, which shouldn't be surprising if you know the backstory behind Nas and 50 Cent's relationship. Digga, who is the producer on the song, had this to say. I created the beat probably two or three years before it was released on an album. This was around the time we started putting together Dipset. That was actually one of the first tracks we started working on for the first Dipset album. It had Cam, Jim Jones, and Joel Santana on it. We made tracks and it didn't really move, so then I tried to get some tracks to Nas. He was working on his album and the Bravehearts album. He picked two tracks and that was one of them. Nas recorded to it and one of the Bravehearts. 50 was in a Nas session and he heard the track and liked it. He got Lenny Nicholson, the a and at Sony at the time, to give him a copy so he would write to it. I didn't even pay attention to who the artist was at the time. I was focusing on making beats for the Dipset album. It was just finding the sample and trying to make one of the grimiest New York beats possible. I was always thinking of Havoc and Mob Deep, just being dark. I was intentionally not trying to sample the main parts of records. I heard the final song over the phone. Sha played it for me over the phone and then I heard the final in my lawyer's office. It was exactly what I wanted it to be as far as having that gritty, dirty type feeling. Lenny Nicholson, the former a and at Sony, had this to say about the record. 50 Cent's song Mini Men was a Nas track first. He actually vocaled it. He was developing another artist named Nashawn. He had to massively impress Nas. If Nas started something, he would add his vocal to it and see if Nas would be impressed enough to keep it. Nas didn't finish that track. That was a track that he just fell out of love with. Nicholson, with permission from Nas, then gave the beat to 50 Cent. And the rest is pretty much history. If Nas kept the track, then it most likely would have ended up on his 2002 album, God's Son, in which a lot of people love that album. I asked a question one time of how many classic albums does Nas have and what are they? And I saw God's Son as one of the albums that was in a lot of comments. Imagine God's Son with Nas's take on the beat for many men. That could have been crazy. And just imagine Get Rich or Die Trying without many men. 
it would still be a classic album, but Many Men definitely adds to it, and who knows? 50 Cent probably could have made a very similar song on another beat. So, I mean, who really knows? Also, this is a bonus fact for you guys, but another record that was originally going to be Nas's was Alicia Keys' Kanye-produced song, You Don't Know My Name. Yeah, tripped me out when I found out. This is what Lynn Nicholson had to say about it. Kanye gave that to me for Nas first. We recorded that in the Bahamas the same day we did Destroy and Rebuild. He went down memory lane. The track gave him that vibe. It was him and Lord in the studio reminiscing about a bunch of things. He did a sing-songy hook to it. It was an excellent record. So in conclusion, maybe Nas's version of both of these songs are out there somewhere, but man, it's been years. I would think people would still want to hear them. I mean, it's Nas, so like, why wouldn't you? But it's really up in the air who would have these songs lying around somewhere, rather knowingly or unknowingly. We know that they exist or existed at one point, but it's very unsure if they'll ever leak or be made public for people to enjoy. This is actually an interesting one that I came across while making this video and I had no clue about these events that I'm about to talk about and I had no clue that they ever happened. I think if you're at least a casual hip hop fan, then you know that Kendrick Lamar and Drake have been in like a cold war when it comes to rap beef or battling. They've exchanged numerous shots at each other over the years, but they've never really went head to head on wax like that. I always thought they should have back in the day because I feel like it could have been a career defining moment for either of them, but we never really got to see it. So the story behind this segment was brought to the light by Marcellus Wiley, a former NFL player, but at this time during these events, he was working for ESPN doing Sports Nation. But according to him, this is how the story goes and keep in mind, he doesn't name names, but we'll get into that later. But they were filming for the show Sports Nation, which according to Marcellus, at least at this time, sometimes was taped and sometimes they went live. On this particular day, when they did an interview with Kendrick or Drake, it was taped. They were taping the interview and Marcellus said that he knew something was in the air between Kendrick and Drake. So they asked whatever person that they interviewed, what's up with the beef? All of a sudden, whoever they interviewed started talking crazy. They was talking that, they was talking reckless. And obviously, everybody was kind of shocked by this. Marcellus fully realizes that this actually might be something. So he throws out a follow up question, and the person they interviewed actually doubled down. And everybody is just in shock at what just happened. Some time goes by and the show is over and Marcella says that this is around noon and they would just wait around until the show would go live at 1. Marcellus is walking off set and now is waiting on the show to go live when the bosses come up to Marcellus and probably the other people who were on the crew and said that they couldn't air the interview. That person they interviewed had their camp called them and said that that segment shouldn't be aired and it puzzled Marcellus because he thought, well, they shouldn't have said what they said. And he questioned if this person would have said it if it was live. Now, Marcellus hasn't said if the person they interviewed was Drake or Kendrick, but if you look at the comments underneath Marcellus's Vlad TV interview on this topic, you'll see a vast majority of people saying that it's Drake. People have connected or attempted to connect the dots with who it was by saying that at this time the segment was shot or was supposed to air, Drake was on a press run. Big Sean dropped his song Control in August of 2013 and many of us watching probably already know that a lot of rappers were mad or had something to say about Kendrick's verse on that song. That's a story for a whole other day and I've actually considered dedicating a whole video to that one day but anyways, people also feel like it was Drake because of what he said about the control verse that Kendrick did. I'm pretty sure Drake has talked about it multiple times, but here's some quotes of some things that he has said about that verse. Kendrick is giving people moments, but are you listening to it now at this point in time? Okay, it was real cool for a couple weeks. If I asked you, for example, how does that verse start? Mind you, it'll go on. Complex and Rap Radar will give it like 
verse of the millennium and all that stuff or whatever. Then Drake would also continue on and say this in an interview. I know that verse had no malice behind it because I saw him five days later at the VMAs and it was all love. He didn't come on there in some wild, I'm in New York, F everybody, don't look at me. It was one of those things I always wished he had come in there on that stuff because I kind of lost a little respect for the sentiment of the verse. If it's really F everybody, then it needs to be F everybody. It can't be halfway for the sake of the people. So like I said a little earlier, people believed Drake was on a press run and this theory or whatever shouldn't be overlooked because Drake's album Nothing Was The Same did come out a month later after that control verse and Nothing Was The Same was dropped in September of 2013. I've never really seen Kendrick on ESPN like that now that I think about it. I literally looked up Kendrick Lamar ESPN on YouTube and all I could find was that he did a performance on ESPN like that same year in 2013, but that was all the way back in March. We do know that Drake has appeared on ESPN multiple, when I say multiple, I mean multiple times. This also brings me to think that this is 2013 Kendrick. This isn't 2021 Kendrick. Do y'all believe Kendrick or TDE had that power to really shut all that down? Or do you really think that they just like wanted to just shut it all down? I mean, there's a possibility because Marcellus did say that he thinks that people at ESPN might have thought that this beef was going to go to like Tupac and Biggie level, which like, let's keep it a buck. Like, no, like it was not. But like, I personally don't even think Kendrick would even do that. He literally just took a shot at the whole rap game, the whole rap game and got so much heat. And now he wants an interview taken down because he's wilding out on Drake. Drake. Like, make it make sense. Like, like make it make sense. Like, I'm not saying this to, like, hate on Drake, but I mean, like, all signs just, like, point to him. If it happens to be Kendrick, I would be very surprised, and I would gladly eat my words. But I would be very, 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 very surprised. But I do think that if it was Drake, then Drake realized, oh, shoot, if this airs, I'm about to be in a war with Kendrick. And we all know at that point, and even now, Kendrick is definitely favored to win. Y'all know the expression of what people say when somebody drinks some alcohol? They say that they get that liquid courage in them. Like, yo, like right now, like I'm in college, you know what I mean? And there's been a few times, well, a lot of times, I've been out with the boys and one of my friends might see a girl. She's looking like a dime piece. She's looking like a 10, you know what I mean? And my friend, you know, they might be a little scared to talk to her. But then they get a couple sips of that drink, you know what I mean? And then they think that they can get any girl in the party. Like, that's what I feel like Drake is on. But in this context, I think that ever since Drake body meek, like, he thinks that he can take on all challengers and he can just win. But, like, it doesn't matter if it's 2013 Kendrick, 2014, 2017, 2012, 2011. I still think Drake will lose in a battle. I do want to keep it to the topic at hand, though, and not get too carried away. But, yeah, like, that's pretty much the story behind this segment. Marcellus did have this to say about it, though. The footage is somewhere at ESPN Studio where I used to work. So, if y'all want to go get that. So that's out there. I'm going to put that in the book. I finally get the names and I finally say who did what. A lot of people have been asking about that. I don't think Marcellus really revealed what exactly happened in the book he was talking about because obviously there would have been more news about the situation and more articles mentioned in the book. The footage might not actually be quote unquote lost. It's definitely not found, but coming across it will be very, very hard to do if it still exists. The general public will probably never see this segment of Sports Nation and the mystery behind who they interviewed still remains. I haven't talked much about Eminem on this channel, but when someone in my comment section requested to talk about the lost version of his song Stan, I really started to get intrigued. I'm not a huge Eminem fan. I definitely respect him and his position in the game, but you will rarely catch me bumping his music. But I will say that I love his song Stan. Like, I absolutely love that song. I love how the song is crafted, great story, great everything. But I had no clue about this lost version of the song at all. 
I was doing some research and I found Eminem made a very lengthy annotation on Genius starting at his third verse on the song. This is what Eminem had to say about the lost version. When we recorded Stan, I worked with a couple different engineers, but this particular engineer I had never worked with before. While we were recording the third verse of Stan, he started rolling a joint and asked me if I minded if he smoked while we cut. What was I going to do? Say no? He was already rolling it up, so I told him no problem. Everything was cool and I had gotten all the way to the last three lines and I screwed up. So all he had to do was punch in my vocals at the end so I could redo that line and the verse was finished. Back then, we were recording on two inch tape. So once you recorded over something, it's gone forever. So I'm in the booth waiting and he backs the tape all the way to the beginning of the verse and punches me in. I realized he's in the wrong spot and I can't hear any of my vocals. So I started waving my hands and yelling in the mic to try to get his attention. He doesn't notice. So I run into the control room through a cloud of smoke and yell, yo, I wanted to keep those vocals. He just looked at me and said, my bad, man, you want to hit this? The first half of the verse was gone. I re-recorded it, but you should have heard the original take. That stuff was way better. Just imagine that, an already great song being even better if it wasn't for that dang engineer. There was also supposed to be another verse on the song, and this is Eminem explaining what would have happened. There was a verse where he got out of the water. You know, he escaped and then came to my house to kill me, and then I had to kill him first, and then I missed him, and he was in the hospital for like three weeks, and then he was pissed off that I didn't write him. Get well cards and shit like that, so he came to kill me again. And in the last verse, finally, I just blew his head off. With that being said, this original version of Stan is lost forever. The record still went on to do very, very well, and it honestly aged like wine. Chief Keith, definitely one of the most influential artists of this newer generation in rap, and he did so at a very, very, very early age and actually went on to inspire people older than him. Chief Keith is still putting out great music, and he makes it seem just so effortless all the time. I hate when people say that he fell off, but it's mainly because people say that because he's not signed to a major anymore. But he definitely has very loyal fans, and he's still very much relevant, and his music still puts up numbers. But today, we're talking about an unreleased track from what many people would call Chief Keef's Prime. This track is probably one of, if not the most sought after, unreleased songs Chief Keef has in his discography. And people still, to this day, still yearn for it to be released. I actually originally wasn't even going to put this segment in the video, but I got recommended the low quality version on YouTube and I clicked on it because I never heard it up until that point. And then upon reading the comments, I got intrigued with the story behind the song. I fully understand why people love and have a connection with this song. I love the beat and how Chief Key flows on the track. And now I really, really want to hear a CDQ version of the song, but we'll get into that fiasco in a bit. For those who haven't heard the song, I'll play it for you right now. Now, this probably has to be one of the most confusing things I have ever researched and made content on. The whole timeline for this track is just really, really weird, and there's just so much hearsay. People claim it still exists, while others, including Chief Keith, has said that it's lost forever, just like a lot of songs from 2013 to 2014. While I was doing research for this video, while listening to Dorito Days on repeat, I came across an interesting comment which got a lot of likes and nobody who replied really went against what was said. The comment goes, Dorito Day still exists, confirmed by Choppa, and it's supposedly an unfinished MP3 hook verse, then hook as confirmed by Uthend on Reddit. 
All his old 2013, 2014 songs still exist according to reliable sources. His old homies in Chicago and the people that used to F with GBE got these songs because Keith used to burn CDs of unreleased and share them with his homies. Plus, he also sent music to them through various emails. Keith has even said that he got family that got old computers and old homies with unreleased songs. We know someone has his old Mac drive from 2013 with all the songs, probably his cousin, but they all exist through emails too. Whoever still has emails with the song files attached has the songs. Now the people that have all his 2013 music sell them and share them with leakers, which led to unreleased songs getting scattered around the world with various people. The only reason they are lost to Keith is because he doesn't have them, others do. Whoever has Dorito Days knows that even a little CDQ snippet would cause hella buzz for the full thing. This is interesting and I will say it kind of makes sense from first glance, especially it being lost to Chief Keith but not other people. Then there is this thing of the laptop the song is on including a lot of other sought after songs were taken by the Chicago police. I've also seen comments about how he found most of the songs except for Dorito Days which is just like wow. like. <laughs> That's just wow. But there's a video of a fan asking Chief Keep about Dorito Days, and this is what he had to say about it. Chief Keef talks very low in the video, but if you didn't hear, basically Chief Keef said he has to redo that song and says that's one song that's really lost. It's interesting because we actually do have an official instrumental for the song, which sounds heavenly by the way. Really vintage Chief Keef sound and beat from his prime, but the problem is if Chief Keef redoes the song, then it definitely won't sound like the version most people are used to and have listened to for years. This is 2021 and not 2013, 2014 Chief Keef. So his voice sounds way different and he has changed a lot since then. I would still be up to listen to a newer version. And I mean, like there are lyrics from the song floating around too. He has the beat, the lyrics. I mean, what more can you ask for? Longtime fans would deeply appreciate it. And throughout the years, this song has been teased and teased. I wish I knew more about unreleased Chief Keef songs and their history because before Dorito days, I think that the only like unreleased songs that I really really used to bump by Keith was Lola Bunny. Like I think that that's probably it. But thanks to Dorito Days, I did discover another highly sought after track from Chief Keef's unreleased discography, and it's Low Life. Not gonna lie, I think I prefer Low Life over Dorito Days only like a tad bit. Like yo, Dor Low Life, crazy yo. But here's a small clip of Low Life just to know what I'm talking about. Both are great in their own rights, and man, Prime Chief Keep was something else, and Keep is already a legend, man. He's only 26 and has already done so much. If you know more about Dorito Days or anything else I talked about in the video, let me know in the comment section below. Who knows, maybe someday I'll talk about another unreleased Chief Keef track if there's enough history behind it. In conclusion, we had to beat a low quality version of Dorito Days and lyrics. Chief Keef could remake the song, but time will tell if that actually happens. Will we ever get a CD quality version of the song? I will personally say I don't know. Maybe it will turn up one day if Chief Keef doesn't remake it, but we'll never know. For now, the official CD quality version of the song is lost. What a surprise. This is Nas' third time in this series so far. He just has a lot of lost slash found media throughout his career. And this one I'm about to get into is insane. The year is 1999 and a music video directed by Hype Williams was produced for Nas' single Hate Me Now. 
featuring Diddy off of his album, I Am. Now today, we do have an official video for Hate Me Now, but there was controversy behind the original version of the video. The controversy being that the video depicted Nas and Diddy being crucified among other things. After shooting for the video was completed, Diddy had second thoughts about his crucifixion scene. Diddy is religious. I'm pretty sure he's Catholic, I want to say, and there's a story floating around that he went to his priest or pastor. I've seen both mentioned in numerous articles that I read regarding this incident, but I obviously know the difference between the two. But anyway, that's besides the point. He met with one or the other and decided that he wanted his crucifixion scene cut from the video. Three days before the video was set to air, Diddy reached out to Nas's manager at the time, Steve Stout, multiple times in which he requested that all footage of him interacting with the cross be removed. However, there seemed to be an error in communication with the original version of the video premiering on MTV's music video countdown show, Total Request Live or TRL for short. Diddy was watching live and within minutes of the video premiere, Diddy and his bodyguards allegedly assaulted Steve Stout in his office. There's stories of the champagne bottle being broken on Steve Stout's head and such, but anyways, that episode of TRL would re-air five hours later, and by that time, the original cut of the video was swapped with the version having all the offensive scenes edited out. In this Los Angeles Times article I read, it said that Diddy went to a pastor, and they interviewed the pastor that he went to, which is named Pastor Hezekiah Walker. Walker would say that he told Diddy that it was blasphemous for him to wear the crown of thorns and that he also objected to Diddy's use of profanity as well as an image of a black crow landing on the cross. Diddy did approve an edit of the video on April 11th and Columbia Records, who Nas was under at the time, delivered the video to MTV on April 12th. MTV screening committee would then review the video that day and then ask Columbia to delete several images involving drinking and obscenity that the network deemed offensive. However, though, the crucifixion scene was not among the cuts requested by MTV. Like I said earlier, there were sources close to Diddy who said that he tried to reach out to Steve Stout several times to tell him that the cuts needed to be made before the video aired. It was then reported that Steve Stout put in several return calls to Walker that went unanswered before Columbia Records returned the video with their crucifixion scene still in it to MTV on April 15th when the video was set to premiere. That was done around 1 p.m. And at 2 p.m., Walker would speak on the phone with Steve Stout about the concerns with the video and allegedly was promised that those concerns would be resolved before the video aired. After this, Walker would then visit Diddy in his recording studio with two ministers to tell him that everything had been settled. Around 420 that day is when the video aired. Yeah, y'all can laugh and get your 420 jokes off <laughs> or whatever. But the video would air and the unedited crucifixion scene appeared and Diddy was shocked. He reportedly told the pastor that he would be back in a few minutes, but he never returned. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but, but, but I hate to laugh at this situation, but this is wild. I expected this to be like a two minute like get in, get out story. And I thought that I knew like everything about the situation. But this LA Times article is just like wild. But Diddy would obviously get into legal trouble, but I don't want to get into all that for this segment. If y'all want to know more about the situation in full, definitely let me know in the comment section below because it's more like layers to this, like I promise you. However, there is no video of Diddy being on the cross, but in 2020, Hype Williams posted a picture of him, Nas, and Diddy on the set of the video, and Diddy is on the cross. In conclusion, the original video was aired to the public at one point of time before it was quickly replaced with another version. We may never ever see the original version of the Hate Me Now video, but we do have a picture of Diddy on the cross.
I was scrolling on the Lost Media Wiki and I came across this and was intrigued. I've gotten recommended to talk about Kanye's scrap show Alligator Boots in this series, but I wasn't interested in talking about it because of how many people already know about it and have made videos on it. I haven't really seen too many people talk about what I'm about to talk about, but according to the Lost Media Wiki article about this untitled Kanye West comedy project, it says that in January of 2007, HBO announced the development of an untitled comedy series from Larry Charles starring Kanye West. This project was said to focus on a day in the busy life of Kanye with events inspired by Kanye's actual experiences. By 2008, the project was shelved indefinitely. A pilot was shot but never officially released. And despite an unofficial screening in 2013, only a few minutes of footage have surfaced online. Here's a clip of the footage from this project that we do have available. Is he here? Yeah, is, he's is right he in front of you. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm with the make a wish kid. I can't even see him right now. I'm trying to I'm trying to do this thing with my hoodie, and you're calling me right now. Hello? Is he here? Yeah, he's right. He's to your left again. Right there, right Hold there. On. I, I'm gonna have to right. call you back. I'm with the make a wish kid. Julio, yeah. could you um put the PSP down maybe and talk to Kenny a little bit? Kanye. I'm sorry? Kanye. Oh, I'm from Ohio. We say Kenny. That's how we pronounce it. Well, I don't care where you're from. You pronounce my name Kanye. Oh, okay. Let's go. Kanye. 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 Yeah, okay. Like Kanye Rogers. Island in the stream. Who's your favorite, like, who's your favorite artist? Who, who do you like? The Wayne. R. Kelly's cool. Um, Lloyd. I like... DJ Unk, walk it out. That was real cool. What? Do you like any of my songs? They're okay. For those who's wondering who Larry Charles is, well, he had previously worked on shows and movies such as Seinfeld, Borat, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and Entourage, and was attached to the project as executive producer and director. Kanye had previously met with NBC to discuss the idea of creating a television series, but nothing came of it until HBO put him in contact with Larry Charles. In order to prepare for the series, Kanye had Matt Besser come to his house to receive private lessons on improv. The majority of the episode featured Kanye surrounded by a cast of people, including his cousin KC, who's played by Wyatt Cynic, his manager, who's played by J.B. Smoove, his bodyguard, who's played by Leonard Harris, a.k.a. GLC, and his mother, played by Kim Whitley. Speaking of Wyatt Cynic or Cynac, we'll, we'll talk about him a little bit more later in the segment, but in a 2013 interview with Vulture magazine, he confirmed what Larry Charles said in a 2008 interview about Kanye thinking of himself as the Black Larry David. He also said that Kanye wanted to make a Curb Your Enthusiasm type show and also acknowledged that shows like Entourage and Sex in the City were other influences. Despite Kanye getting lessons on improv, he soon realized that he wasn't the best improviser in the cast and would give away parts initially meant for him to do. HBO ordered a half hour show, so Kanye being Kanye went ahead and sent them a one hour episode. This would lead to the episode being returned by the network with instructions to cut it down to 30 minutes. Those extra 30 minutes featured interviews with people like Cornell West, Nelson George, and Boyce Watkins talking about the impact of Kanye and his music. HBO would end up giving Larry Charles $400,000 in five days to shoot the pilot. This is what Larry Charles had to say in an interview. HBO, it wasn't like they were super excited. They gave us very little money, but I will embrace that. If I think we can do something great and this is the only way we can do it, let's try. Kanye was very open to it, and in the way Seinfeld was smart about this and Jack Benny was smart about this, he was not afraid to have the people around him be really funny and be a straight man for them. I wanted to give it a structure and a vibe that was more true to Kanye and his world than the Curb style. We wrote an outline and excerpt 
for certain lines that needed to be said, improvised a lot of it. But you're improvising with 10 people, which was a great challenge. I like getting into this Altman-esque thing where there are a lot of people going around talking and overlapping because that's Kanye's world. That kind of barely contained chaos. Throughout July and August of 2008, the show was still in development and the network was reportedly looking for a writer to move forward with it. However, in September of 2008, Larry would do an interview about the show and he would say this. It was really good, but again, I think it was too hardcore for HBO. Also, HBO's management shifted, but HBO doesn't have a good track record when it comes to black shows and I felt like that may have had something to do with it also. I don't see a lot of shows about that experience at all. This was very entertaining and we showed it to a lot of people. People gave it a very good response and it seems to be on the shelf right now. The management has shifted at HBO so we're waiting to see. In October, MTV posted an article saying that they reached out to a rep from HBO and said that she had no knowledge of the show's status, noting that the show has been in development for some time and adding that until it is actually shot or picked up as a pilot, she didn't have any info. Obviously, we all know that the show would never happen, but in 2010, there was a four minute clip from the pilot that was uploaded to YouTube. It went unnoticed until 2013 when Gawker and other news outlets reported on it leading to the clip being removed from YouTube. A week after it was rediscovered, Wyatt Senek, who I mentioned earlier, played Kanye's cousin KC in the pilot, screened the full 30 minute cut of the pilot during his weekly stand-up show Night Train in Brooklyn, New York. The screening was unannounced, but Wyatt didn't have permission from HBO to show it. What's interesting is that while he screened the pilot, him and Questlove would provide commentary giving background information about the production. Some of the things that were said was the story of Kanye stopping production to take a call from Tom Cruise while everyone listened. He wanted Tom Cruise to be on the show and Tom Cruise declined, so Kanye got a Tom Cruise lookalike. Like, <laughs> but Wyatt also said that GLC refused to wear the makeup that the crew insisted on applying to reduce the sheen from his baldness. He eventually caved in under the condition that it was never called makeup and instead it will be called player powder. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> that yo that made my day like no cap like player powder like <laughs> so Wyatt would say that this would lead to frequent shout outs of I need to get my player powder looked at <laughs> on set <laughs> and he would say it and he delivered it in all seriousness <laughs> player powder could not make it up one of the other things that we learned is that hbo thought that there wasn't enough kanye even though he has the most camera time but he ultimately left himself with not much to do while he was on camera the audience's reaction to the pilot was fairly mixed you had a gawker writer who described the leaked clip as probably the worst thing Kanye has ever created, but after he watched the full pilot, he called it one of the most crazy, wonderful pieces of television you can't imagine. Another thing a lot of people thought about the pilot upon seeing it in full is that they felt that it lagged. When asked about screening the pilot, Wyatt said this, I figured if I did it as a surprise, there's nothing HBO could really do about it, except keep me out of HBO shows, which they're already doing. In conclusion, this pilot has been partially found on the internet, and it is unlikely that either cut of the pilot will ever see an official release. In 1999, thousands of dollars worth of vinyl records and a home recording studio belonging to Q-Tip of a tribe called Quest were destroyed in a fire in his home in Inglewood, New Jersey at the time. The Inglewood Fire Department's lieutenant said that the fire began on the ground floor of the three-story townhouse where Q-Tip kept his extensive record collection and home studio. Q-Tip nor the other people in the house were injured 
In an interview, Q-Tip says that he lost a number of unreleased songs in the fire, and at the time, Q-Tip was working on what would be a Tribe Called Quest's album called The Love Movement, which was originally named The Last Movement. In 2015, a member of a Tribe Called Quest, Fife Dog, had this to say about the fire in an interview. Yeah, that was a fire that happened at Q-Tip's old house, and he lost the majority of his record collection, as well as several recordings for that last album that he had. When asked if it was too far deep into the recording of the album, Five Dog said that they didn't have to start all over with the music, but said Q-Tip lost more of his record collection than the recordings per se. In 2013, Q-Tip spoke at the Red Bull Music Academy, and he would say this about the fire. And also around the time of Amplified, right around that time, I had a fire and had about maybe close to 20,000 records. I had all the stuff I worked on with Dilla, like all tribe, like crazy stuff, and I lost everything. And I was in the house. Everything was just gone. Q-Tip thinks that the fire was very symbolic for him because he knew that he still had it in him to do music. He was faced with the challenge of not having records to chop and sample, so he studied and studied music theory and played the piano along with other things. Five Dog thought that the fire really wasn't a big deal because he felt like A Tribe Called Quest never really missed a beat. He says that that's why it wasn't really talked about in the A Tribe Called Quest documentary. This is Five Dog's words, but I mean, I'm trying to give y'all multiple perspectives of this situation because out of everybody, the main people that I've found who has discussed it really is Five Dog and Q-Tip. Q-Tip would obviously know more about the situation though, ever since I've talked about RZA from the Wu-Tang Clan's basement studio flooding twice and how much music they lost, people commented that I should mention what happened to Q-Tip. In conclusion, all those records and recordings are lost forever due to the fire. J Electronica is an interesting figure to say the least, a man that at times seems more like a myth instead of an actual person, someone who legit could have went down as one of the greatest rappers of all time, but the man literally made people wait over a decade for his debut album. I have a whole documentary on J Electronica that you guys should definitely go check out, probably one of if not the most underrated videos that I've ever done, like no cap, but not a lot of people know that. Before his debut album, A Written Testimony, and even before Act 2, J Electronica had two projects. In 2018, the internet discovered a J Electronica project from around 2000, but he wasn't going by the name J Electronica at the time. At the time it was leaked or whatever you want to call it, people were questioning if it was actually J Electronica. But I mean, it clearly is. You can tell in the music. The only thing is just that this is a younger version of J Electronica and not as polished. But I mean, this is his early music that we're talking about. For a little minute, the album was on SoundCloud, but it was soon to be taken down. But that's where I come in to provide you guys with the link so you guys can listen to it in full and tell me what you guys think. For the time being, I'll play you guys a couple tracks to prove that this is for real. Everybody witness the power as I reign supreme. I lay low in the cut and rise to the top like cream. Ah, been rhyming since the days of old. Since Christian Dior below waves and gold. Many got back down, my man called a slow to the jungle and thug with a check nine. I watched them pass away, and so I passed and prayed because I came to the conclusion this is real life, not an illusion. Gotta be fine, my mind's working time, divine, and get rid of this confusion. Oh, money won't match that fast cash, you might get that ass blast, crash, go to jail, free pass, flow, shine, use your mind, get on, climb, climb, fine, everything I'm seeing. If you guys want to know more, then definitely check out the link in the description. And now we're going to talk about J Electronica's time in Detroit. While in Detroit, J Electronica befriended associates of the late J Dilla, RIP by the way, and also RIP to Five Dog in like the last segment. And they began working closely and collaborating with people like Mr. Porter. Now the story behind his other project, War with the Dragon, which is the second project that I managed to get my hands on, is that from what I've read, before it was a titled project, War with the Dragon was a collection of songs that Jay had recorded over the winter of 2002 and the spring of 2003. 
Once it was completed, Jay would drive from Detroit to New York to put it in Diddy's hands. He was hustling CDs outside of the Bad Boy offices until he managed to get a meeting at Bad Boy. They would wait for the meeting, but sadly it never happened because at the time they were filming Making the Band and it ended up taking a long time and Jay and his friends were told they were going to have to reschedule. After that, nothing ever really materialized again and it was back to the drawing board for Jay Electronica. Let me preview some tracks that I have from that project. Who rock moves that soon? I pay dues and stay smooth. Never lose. I move. How I choose. They want to creep the kid and give me the blues, right? Uh, you can't lock me down. Got Max behind their backs trying to chop me down. Who's the soul controller? That's the greatest question alive. The best shepherd is he who makes the sheep turn wise. It's the new world order. We build and destroy. You motherfuckers looking at the real McCoy. MC and Supreme B and all I see in DJ Electronica. The hell breaks loose. Young boy, what's your name? Your arms too short to box with. The eye, your arms are Christ smashing your fiber optics. I'm fire bombing your rap, blasting you from the cockpit. You ain't ready to stop dropping rock with the solar rocket. Don't try me. In conclusion, both of these albums have been found, and I put a link in the description for you guys to enjoy. Originally, when I did the J Electronica documentary, I only had access to seven songs on War with the Dragon, but I found a playlist on YouTube with nine songs, so I'll just put that link for you guys to enjoy. This one right here is rather interesting to say the least. The story goes that producer The Alchemist and rapper Earl Sweatshirt made a collab album that was posted on YouTube under a fake name and YouTube page. It has a fake album cover with song titles, The Whole Nine, according to The Alchemist. This was brought to light in early 2019 when Alchemist talked about it on Twitter. This put people into a frenzy trying to look for the album and now it's 2021 and no one has found it yet. I will say that on the bright side, Alchemist recently has talked about an upcoming Earl Sweatshirt album and called it incredible and said that Earl was in his bag. In that same interview where Alchemist talked about Earl Sweatshirt's upcoming album, he was asked about the secret project that he has with Earl and he had this to say, I haven't heard anything about it man, it's still just floating in the matrix. I can't even really say anything about it. I've been sworn to just leave it alone. It was just one day of madness. In conclusion, according to The Alchemist, the project is out there on YouTube somewhere and hopefully one day it'll be found. I've recently done a video on Benny the Butcher, so definitely go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. Really dope video where me and Dev Goldblum broke down his whole career. In that video, we talked about the Tana Talk series that Benny is known for. The inspiration for Tana Talk is said to be a reference to the block in which Benny grew up on, which is Montana Avenue in Buffalo, New York, which is a famous drug block in buffalo also i just want to say prayers out to buffalo um obviously during the making of this video had that tragedy happen in buffalo so definitely you know prayers out for everybody in buffalo and all things like that the second installment of the tenor talk series was released in 2005 and this is when he was simply going under the name benny and benny appears to be iced out with montana avenue being featured in the background these were the Buff City Street Entertainment days for Benny. The next Tana Talk wouldn't be released until almost 13 years later when Benny would release Tana Talk 3 in November of 2018. Many people regard Tana Talk 3 as some of, if not Benny's best work, and this project really put a spotlight on him and is regarded as one of the best projects of that year that it was released. Benny has recently released the fourth installment of the Tana Talk series with Tana Talk 4, which released in March of 2022. Now you might be wondering, what happened to the first installment of the Tana Talk series? Well, to be honest with you, 
Benny Wu released the first Tana Talk in 2004. Now this mixtape is extremely hard to find. I was looking all over the internet and throughout Reddit and people are in the same boat trying to find information about this project and I even saw someone say that in an interview Benny has said that he doesn't even have a copy for himself. Then I've seen people say that Benny says that only one person has the physical copy so there's that. There was recently a video posted on YouTube of the alleged Tana Talk 1, but Benny has confirmed on Twitter that this video is false and not the real Tana Talk 1. I haven't listened to the whole Tana Talk 2, but I didn't really like the tracks that I heard all that like much because this was very, very early Benny and he was still developing his sound and his artistry. Tana Talk 3 is phenomenal and I really did like Tana Talk 4, but it does still suck that we do not have Tana Talk 1. It really makes the series feel kind of incomplete and I even saw someone comment that not having Tana Talk 1 is like not having the Carter one in Lil Wayne's The Carter series. Obviously, I get the equivalent outside of how more highly regarded the Carter series is, but imagine not having Carter 1, but you have Carter 2 through 5. It like would just wouldn't feel right. It doesn't even matter if Ten I Talk 1 is good or bad. I just think that just to have it will be dope because for Benny to have a whole project missing in his discography, a part of a series that he's perhaps most known for is really, really crazy. In conclusion, Tana Talk 1 isn't widely available for people to enjoy, and if you want to find the original CD all the way from 2004, then good luck. Even if a couple of lucky people do manage to have it in their possession, then they have hold of some rare stuff right there, and honestly, I don't see the general public being able to enjoy Tana Talk 1. It's wild to think that Tana Talk 2 was released only a year later in 2005, and that whole project is on YouTube, but Tana Talk 1 isn't. I don't know how many copies of Tana Talk 1 Benny gave out in 2004, but Benny has said the difference between Tana Talk 1 and 2 is that Tana Talk 1 is when he took over the block, and 2 is when he took over the city with his music. 1 had a neighborhood reach, while 2 had a city reach. For now, we'll declare this as missing slash not available to the general public. This Biggie song is the second topic we will be discussing today and this song has some interesting history behind it. In 1997, Biggie would pass away in March of that year, and in the same month of his passing, the album Life After Death was released. The locks would appear on the track Last Day, which sadly touches on how people live fast but end up dying young. Some history behind this track is that Diddy commissioned Havoc of Mob Deep to do a track back in those days. They recorded on reel to reel tapes, and somehow the original track got lost. Havoc till this day has no clue what happened to it, but he had another track that sounded similar to the one that we all have now. Here's more of what Havoc had to say. Did he commission me to do a track for him? Back in those days, we recorded on reel to reel tapes and somehow the original track got lost. I don't know how. I guess somebody maybe was hating or some stuff. But I had to do another track that sounded similar to the one that you hear now. I remember being in the studio and doing the track and Biggie was in the other room recording. I remember Puff coming in there and just making sure everything was smooth. It was pretty normal and Puff was cool. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. I did what I had to do and I was out. Havoc would further say, yeah, the final is different and Puff was pissed. He was literally pissed like, yo, I want the effing beat I paid for. He was not playing, and I was like, yo, stuff got misplaced, and that's enough to make you not even be effing part of the project. That's enough to make someone say, you know what, eff it, give me my money back. But he had faith in me, I did the beat over, and that didn't happen. I did a video on the locks not that long ago and I discussed this song and said that the song was probably lost forever due to the original track being lost. Someone in the comment section corrected me and said that the original version actually exists and is on YouTube. I went and checked it out and this is what I found. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, no. 
mezzanines make MCs freeze. You're waking up in cold sweat and just dream. You still apologize, analyze my size and your size. Realize a fist fight would be asinine. You just pop wines, I must pop nines. Genuine still be nozzle in your grill piece. So I guess that the original version is really out there and I stand corrected. Even though the quality isn't the best, I do think that this original version is actually better than the version that we have today. The version we have today is great, but I really think that the vibe of the original version is better. In conclusion, it looks like the original version of Last Day has been found. You can listen to it right here on YouTube. I got the idea for this segment from my man Dev Goldblum who I talked about earlier on in the video. He sent me a link to an interview Kendrick Lamar did with Big Boy. When Big Boy asked Kendrick how many unreleased songs that he has but we haven't heard yet, Kendrick said that he had thousands. He says that he has lost hard drives from 2005, 2006 that he's never gotten back. He's taken hard drives all the way to San Francisco to get them fixed, but they never ended up getting fixed. He has plenty of songs in the vault as well. Kendrick also has some of these hard drives and prays that these hard drives can come back to life one day. I don't know how many hard drives Kendrick is talking about, but when Big Boy asked him how much, I guess the one that he still has, Kendrick says that he has about 500 songs on there. This actually doesn't come as a surprise to me because Mixed by Ali, who is Kendrick Lamar's engineer, did an interview in 2020 and said that Kendrick had about six albums worth of unreleased music. For Kendrick alone, let me say, I think we could put together like six albums. It's all about just understanding that you could always do something better. It's having that mindset to just strive for the best possible version of you. That's Kendrick's whole mind state always striving to do better. Whether it's recording a new verse, you know, he would record a whole song and get one ad-lib back a month later because he don't like how he breathed the ad-lib. If Kendrick is talking about music from 2005, 2006, then these are his K-Dot days, which is his earlier music because he changed his rap name to Kendrick Lamar later on. But I think that the intriguing thing about Kendrick is the intrigue of what is this material and what does it sound like. If we're talking about 2005, 2006, then this is super old Kendrick, and I think that diehard fans would be into that. I don't know how much of his 2010s music is unrecoverable or missing, but people still would be interested in hearing it. Kendrick recently did just feed us with an album, which I actually really did like on my first listen, but I'm definitely still interested on if Kendrick can at least get these hard drives to work again. I forgot to mention that Kendrick did drop Untitled Unmastered in March of 2016, which gave us unreleased, untitled, and slightly unmastered songs from 2013 through 2016. Maybe we'll get an Untitled Unmastered 2 one day, I don't really know. In conclusion, it looks like at least the hard drives Kendrick was talking about in the Big Boy interview aren't working and he may have lost some hard drives throughout his music career. I don't really know the chances of if the hard drives Kendrick does have like will ever work again, but it's safe to say that some of the stuff I just talked about is lost and some stuff might be lost forever. This entry was really interesting to me because I have yet to talk about Childish Gambino on my channel, even though back in the day during my middle school days, like yo, like, I was really into him and Chance the Rapper. I've recently been watching a lot of stuff about Donald's show Atlanta, which I love by the way, and I was just getting recommended so many different videos about his music and stuff about the show. I was watching this Childish Gambino Iceberg video since like I really love Iceberg videos and I learned about a project that I had no clue even existed, which is entitled The Younger I Get. From my understanding, The Younger I Get was Childish Gambino's one of, if not the first mixtapes that Childish Gambino ever did. I really looked around the internet for information about this project, but I came across probably one of the only people who actually has this project. Their name is Chaz 
Kangas or Kangas, I'm not really sure. But he appears in the freestyle that Gambino did in 2004 and also had the second verse on Childish Gambino's song, My Hoodie, from his mixtape, Sick Boy. A lot of the information I'm about to say in this section comes from him since he's probably one of the most reliable sources of information regarding this project. According to Chaz, Gambino gave him a copy of The Younger I Get and also handed it out to everyone he knew who was into hip hop at the time in an oddly thick white slim CDR case with the paper cover that had a picture of him recording in his dorm room printed on it. Chaz says that according to Tumblr, he might be the only person on the face of the earth who has it. It does surprise him that in this internet age that the project hasn't surfaced yet, but perhaps that's more of a testament to how those who have this project actually have respect for Donald's wishes and haven't leaked it. Chaz himself has been offered ridiculous amounts of money pretty regularly for this project, but Chaz refuses to cave in. Gambino has gone to great lengths to distance himself from the project, but Chaz says that until that changes, he doesn't feel comfortable sharing it. Chaz clears up some things and says that the project was recorded between 2004 and 2005, not 2002. Chaz says that he's pretty sure that the inaccurate date stems from like a typo from an early 2009 interview where he was asked about it and with nobody to correct it has subsequently been repeated to death. The project has references to 50 Cent, the OC, and Rap Snitch Knishes, so there is literally no possible way this could have been recorded two years prior. 50 Cent had been out before his debut in 2003, but Rap Snitch Knishes appeared on the MF Doom album, mm Food, which released in 2004. But speaking of Doom, he's actually one of Gambino's favorite rappers, and the influence shows on The Younger I Get with Mad Lib also. There's also the chipmunk soul sample sound that makes up half of the production, with the other half having the electric bounce of a jovial Nintendo game. Chaz says that given where both hip hop and Donald was at the time, it's pretty clear that he produced it himself. I'll put a link to Chaz's blog post where he goes into more detail about the project, but in conclusion, it looks like the project does exist, but isn't available to the general public. I have no clue if we'll ever hear this project because it's heavily guarded and Gambino has tried to distance himself from this project. So I ran into this while I was on the Lost Media Wiki, and I'll probably put a link in the description for people to view this. So as many of us know, Snoop Dogg would have released his debut album, Doggy Style, in November of 1993, which peaked at number one on the Billboard 200, selling 806 thousand copies in its first week alone and as of today is four times platinum what a lot of people don't know is that snoop dogg allegedly had a project before doggy style that was called over the counter and was a cassette only really showing the times with this one though it said that this started to have appeared at swap meets in 1991 according to the wiki this project featured 16 tracks on it with one bonus track. Six of the tracks off of this project have resurfaced on compilation albums, such as the compilation album named Folsom The Lost Tapes. The tracks from Snoop Dogg that appeared on this compilation album were true to the game, County Blues, and The Message. I'll play you a little snippet of the song called County Blues. Confronted every second about where you're from, who you slang with, and who you bang with. And don't try to lie like you don't bang. Cause they come one of your homies calling you by your street name. He got you in a pickle. Now you're sitting on a roof, just a freezing like an icicle. You're waiting to get transferred to a module. Oh shit, here we go, another squabble. I found the songs true to the game. County Blues and The Message all on YouTube and they were posted by a person named The Anonymous One so shout out to them but in the description underneath these songs they went in more on the story behind Over the Counter. They said that some of the tracks had been done by Snoop on his own before he came to Death Row and many were early Death Row cuts. 
over the counter, was never pressed to CD, and never really distributed. At this time, Death Row had a temporary distribution deal directly with Time Warner. Death Row bounced around on several companies before signing to Interscope. Many claim this album to be fake, but no one has ever asked Snoop himself, so we'll never know for sure until then. Over the past few years, Over the Counter has become sort of a myth in the hip hop underworld. You can determine its legitimacy. So this is what they posted underneath the tracks, which adds a little bit more to the story behind it. While doing research for this topic, I ran into a video by a YouTuber by the name of Matt Hall, who does a serious near 30 minute deep dive on this alleged project. Definitely go check that out because that video deserves a lot more views and recognition than it does now because Matt really went into serious detail of like while proving and disproving a lot of things regarding over the counter. So definitely watch the whole thing if you want to know more. This might be a controversial entry to this video because of the validity of this tape being in question. I mainly wanted to include it due to it being on the Lost Media Wiki and also to bring more traction around this topic. In conclusion, if this tape really does exist, then there are some tracks that are posted online that we can access. There are a couple of different alleged track lists, but for the rest of the songs on them, if they're real, they are missing and or not available to the general public. If the tape is actually a hoax, then it's fake and not really lost media because it was never real in the first place. If you've been following me for a while, then you would know that Playboy Cardi is one of my favorite artists of all time. I really got into his music during the whole lot of Red version 1 era, so this was like early 2019-ish, and like I soon like realized that this dude has an abundance of leaked material along with some being missing and or lost. I actually wanted to talk about him on this series for like a while now, and I felt like now would be the perfect time. Like many different artists or rappers, Cardi has had eras within his music. I mean, to name a few, then there's like the Cash Cardi era, Self Titled, Die Lit, Whole Lot of Red, Narcissist, etc. Today, I will be discussing the Sir Cardi era, era of who we know today as Playboy Cardi. This is Cardi's very, very, very early music when he was first starting out and under the name Sir Cartier. Now we do have a tape that is readily available from this era, which is named Young Misfit, and you can listen to it through YouTube. I actually really messed with the song Zombies off of this tape. But then there's a tape from the Sir Cartier era named THC The High Chronicles that is essentially lost. Pretty much all of the links to this mixtape lead to dead ends and don't work anymore. People have reached out to a lot of Cardi's old friends and associates about this tape and they either get no response or say that they have it but won't give it up. This reminds me a lot of the Childish Gambino, The Younger I Get situation with people claiming to have it but not willing to release it for multiple reasons. I have seen people link Cardi's old YouTube channel and cite a playlist that he named Sir Cartier THC, but in my opinion, this isn't the full tape. It says that two videos are hidden while there's a video to the song Living Reckless, a chopped and slowed version of the song Carolina Blue, Cry, and Steez. The other two are videos from Uno the Activist, or at this time, Johnny Ace doing a freestyle, and the other one is a song that Johnny Ace did, which he rapped over the beat to the Chris Brown song, Look At Me Now. Now, what are the other two videos? I don't really know. I did some further research and THC, The High Chronicles, was originally supposed to be released in October of 2011, but was pushed back to November of 2011. Only the songs Living Reckless, Carolina Blue Freestyle, and 36 Villains, which was originally named 36 Whippin', are available on the internet. 36 Whippin' was renamed to 36 Villains and ended up being reused on the Young Misfit mixtape. I'll put this alleged track list up for what was supposed to be TAC The High Chronicles. If you want to know more about what the sound of this mixtape would have been like, then I'll play you a snippet of Carolina Blue right quick.
in conclusion, this early Cardi mixtape, if true, is only in possession of a couple of people that are or were close to him. The links that at one point led to this mixtape are now cold, leaving us with only a few songs that were supposed to be on it. This tape as a whole isn't available to the general public anymore and is lost. This is Tupac's second time appearing in this series with this entry being a very interesting topic to say the least. The story behind this is that Angie Martinez, who's a very notable interviewer, especially in the hip hop space, interviewed Tupac in 1996, months before his untimely passing. She would fly to the West Coast by herself to do the interview at Tupac's place. The full interview would be around two hours long and Angie would only air 12 minutes of this interview due to fear of it adding to the East Coast West Coast feud that was going on at the time. You can hear almost seven minutes of this interview right now on YouTube. Upon listening to it, you can kind of tell that Tupac is on one for at least the first part of the clip and cooled off when he was talking about his ex-wife at the end. Angie felt like the part of the interview that she released to the public was the best piece of the interview that wouldn't cause more problems. While speaking about the interview, Angie would say, I was scared to air this interview and I didn't want to be responsible for making it worse. And the truth is that I made that decision and I'm proud of that after all these years. I think about the tragedy that happened to both Tupac and Biggie, like what if I had put that out? I would have forever wondered if I had contributed in any way to what happened even though it may not have. Ultimately it happened anyway, but I know that I did what I could do to not contribute to it. That gave me strength. That helped me to draw my lines in terms of who I am as a personality. Napoleon, who was a member of Tupac's group The Outlaws, while also being a close friend of Tupac, was present during this interview. He feels like Angie now releasing this interview back in the day was a very wise decision due to the chaos that it could have caused, especially with her essentially sitting on a gold mine of an interview. The East Coast West Coast feud was alive and on and Tupac was fresh out of jail. Now there's a ton of speculation on exactly what Tupac said to not have the interview be released. According to Napoleon, Tupac was coming after everybody and dropping names. Diddy, Andre Harrell, and Biggie are some of the names that he talked about. Diddy and Biggie were also not big fans of Angie interviewing Tupac at this time. Napoleon described the interview as Tupac's infamous diss track hit him up, but in interview form. Not only was Tupac naming names, but Napoleon also said that he was threatening people which could have landed him back in prison. There are all sorts of different rumors about what Pac allegedly said, but Napoleon was there during this interview. I can only imagine how the rest of the interview is due to what we got being considered light by Angie Martinez. She's been sitting on this interview for years, and the crazy thing is that this interview could have very well been lost forever if an accident occurred. While Angie Martinez was at a meeting with Rock Nation, Jay-Z asked her about her archives of her old interviews. Previous to this, Angie literally stored her old interviews in a box in her laundry room. Jay-Z demanded Angie to take the box out of her laundry room as soon as possible in case of a fire or flood. Luckily, the interview never got damaged and Angie ended up digitizing the tapes, which some of her co-workers helped her out with. This means that multiple people have heard this interview. Now, Angie has long talked about releasing this interview. She's still hesitant about releasing it, but in multiple interviews throughout the years, she has said that at some point she will. It's nearly been 30 years since the interview was conducted. While doing research, I did come across some interesting information. Gene Dill, who is Diddy's former bodyguard, would talk about this interview in an interview with the art of dialogue. Gene would say that Diddy heard the interview back in the day, way before it was digitized. He would further say that it wasn't her idea to not put out the interview because she didn't own the interview. This is because she works for Hot 97, which is a radio station in New York. Gene also notes that Diddy had a lot of pull at this time, and even now, especially with Hot 97, with him mentioning 
saying that Diddy was responsible for getting Wendy Williams fired from there. This is a story that has been corroborated by multiple people, but I believe that this happened after the Tupac interview. He got the hottest lady on the radio, off the radio, with the phone call according to Gene Deal. But like I said, Gene would say that Diddy would hear the interview back in the day. Gene raised the question of do you think that Hot 97 would deny Diddy if he wanted to hear the interview? About the Wendy Williams thing, Gene would say that Diddy told Hot 97 that if they didn't have her gone by the time that he came back to New York while he was away, none of his artists or his friend's artists would do business with them. This is the type of stuff that makes you really think. In conclusion, we know that the Tupac interview exists, but time will tell if the interview will ever come out. It just sucks because I know a lot of people, including me, want to hear this interview. It's been nearly 30 years and it is a part of rap history. That interview is priceless. This is classified as lost media due to the interview not being available to the general public, even though we know that it exists. Put It On The Streets is regarded as one of the rarest Lil Wayne songs in existence, so rare to the point that many would consider it to be lost due to years of searching but no luck in finding the song. You can easily look up the lyrics to the song online and it appears that the song was short, containing an interlude and verse from Lil Wayne. The album that the song Put It On The Streets was listed on was the Lights Out album that released in December of 2000. In 2013, there was a blogger that was based out of Sri Lanka who put up Lights Out for download online. Based on the track list, the download had put it on the streets as track number 14. Shout out to Martian Master from the Lil Wayne HQ forum because he made a post about this song and went to some lengths to get information about it. He would reach out to this blogger from Sri Lanka on Facebook, Instagram, and Google Plus, but didn't get a response for a while. Finally, Martian Master found the blogger's work email and he would reach out to them. The blogger would finally reply and tell Martian that his blogging days were in the past and he didn't think that he still had the music but he would look for it. The song was available for a download for a small period of time in 2013. In 2017, someone tried to buy a foreign copy of Lights Out but it didn't have the song potentially due to only early pressings of the album having it. One day while scrolling on eBay, Martian Master would come across an official cash money shirt for Lights Out. Martian would state that this wasn't a vintage piece due to the copyright info on the listing. On the back of the shirt, it had a track listing for the album and put it on the streets was listed as track number nine. This was in place of the skit that is on the current versions of the album. Due to this listing, Martian assumes that Cash Money still has this song in their official album listing in their database. He also developed a new theory of what could have happened to the song. Martian explained that this could have been exactly like what happened with the song Playing With Fire which appeared on early pressings of the Carter 3. Due to a lawsuit, the track Playing With Fire was removed from the Carter 3 and was replaced by the song Monster. With Lil Wayne not being as big back in 2000 and the internet being a lot smaller, it would make sense that the removal of the track Put It On The Streets went relatively unnoticed. Martian would also reach out to the engineer for the album Lights Out and he didn't remember the song, but told him that there were multiple scrap songs from Lights Out that were vaulted at Universal, which Cash Money is under. Places online have the song put it on the streets as track 7 or 9 on the album, which is different than the Sri Lankan blogger who had it as number 14. If we're going off what the engineer said, this song could very well be vaulted and we could very well possibly never hear this song in its entirety.
This is something that I found on the Lost Media Wiki and it's something that I've been eyeing to talk about in this series. This is mainly because the ending of the song scared me as a kid when I heard it. The song A Nightmare on My Street was the third single released from DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince's album He's the DJ, I'm the Rapper. The single would peak at number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100. The song would be a parody of the A Nightmare on Elm Street film franchise. A music video was produced for the song which ended up in a lawsuit due to new line cinema being the copyright holders of the a nightmare on elm street franchise they never gave dj jazzy jeff and the fresh pence the authorization to use the freddy krueger character in the music video because of this new line cinema would file a lawsuit against them claiming that the success of the song and video would do irreparable damage because the fat boys would do a song called are you ready for freddy which was authorized and heavily endorsed by New Line Cinema. This song would be a single for their album Coming Back Hard Again and would be the theme song for the movie A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, which was released in 1988. A Nightmare on My Street ended up being a song that was way more popular than the Fatboy song, which did have permission, so in a way, it's understandable why New Line Cinema did this. DJ Jazzy Jeff would say this. Both of the songs came out at the same time and now you got all these radio stations around the country doing contests like what nightmare song do you like the best and what happened is we started beating the fat boys in the contest in a nightmare on elm street's production company new line cinema was back in the fat boys and before we got into the lawsuit we were trying to tell them yo why don't we put the music in the movie or why don't we kind of say that this is another instead of you suing us like you're actually gonna hurt it this is helping your movie. The lawsuit ended up being settled out of court and as a result of this, the vinyl release of He's the DJ, I'm the Rapper contained a sticker that said, this song is not part of the soundtrack and is not authorized, licensed, or affiliated with the Nightmare on Elm Street films. In addition to this, New Line Cinema actually offered DJ Jazzy Jeff and Will Smith film roles, which they declined. I've read that as part of the lawsuit settlement, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince were to be offered two or three movie scripts that they could turn down. Will and Jeff agreed to the deal because they thought that they would just have to reject the scripts. According to DJ Jazzy Jeff, the first script presented to them was the movie House Party. DJ Jazzy Jeff would further say, the first script was House Party because if you think about the premise of House Party, one dude was a DJ and the other one was a rapper. So House Party was set up for Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. We weren't thinking about doing movies back then. They were like, what do you think about this? And we were like, oh, we don't like it. And what about this? Oh, we don't like it. Ha, we out. Reginald Hudlin, who directed House Party, would do an interview and pretty much told the same story. He noted that he felt a bit uneasy about approaching DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince because he knew that if they signed on to do the film, they would only be doing so because of the lawsuit. He would still reach out to them, but the duo would turn down the movie. This has been disputed by Play of Kid and Play, who went on to star in House Party as part of Kid and Play. Play would say that the Fresh Prince and DJ Jazzy Jeff were offered the movie House Party by New Line Cinema executives, not because of the lawsuit. He would say that it was the lawsuit that prompted the two to reject the movie. It kind of depends on who you ask what happened, but I I've also read that allegedly as a result of the lawsuit, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince could work off the settlement money by appearing in New Line Films, which theoretically allowed them to get away with not having to pay out of pocket over the lawsuit. But back to the Lost Media Wiki article and it says that another result of the lawsuit would be that all known copies of the music video would be destroyed. Due to it being unknown if the music video was ever actually broadcast, there was a chance that the footage was lost forever. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince both had copies of the music video after the lawsuit. DJ Jazzy Jeff had a copy that he gave to an old girlfriend and she taped soap operas over it. The Fresh Prince also had a copy of the music video that he gave to his dad and his dad lost the tape. Due to both of them not having copies of the music video anymore and few people ever seeing it, the story for the search of this music video could have ended there. 
30 years after the release of A Nightmare on My Street, a music video for the song was uploaded by Nancy Thompson on YouTube. The video appeared to be a VCR recording of the original music video from when it originally aired. It's noted that the quality of the footage has degraded over time, suffering from tracking issues, color grading errors, and other artifacts along with the portion of a Growing Pains episode accidentally taped over a few seconds of footage. A month after this, in November of 2018, the official DJ Jazzy Jeff Vivo YouTube channel uploaded a cleaner version of the video, presumably taken from the original master video tape. So the status of this piece of media has now been found and you can watch the music video in its entirety on YouTube. Shaq is widely regarded as one of the greatest basketball players of all time. I've mentioned him on this series before when I mentioned his former teammate Kobe's found rap album, R.P. Kobe. But just like Kobe, Shaq tried his hand in rap, but it would be before Kobe. In 1993, Shaq would release his debut album Shaq Diesel in October of that year. The album peaked at number 25 on the Billboard 200 and spawned three successful singles. The song I Know I Got Skills would end up peaking at number 35 on the Billboard Hot 100, What's Up Doc, Can We Rock, ended up peaking at number 39 on the Billboard Hot 100, and the single I'm Outstanding would peak at number 47 on the Billboard Hot 100. Less than a year after its release, the album Shaq Diesel went platinum in March of 1994. This would end up being his biggest album with his sophomore album Shaq Fu The Return not doing as great, but still managing to go gold months after its release. While Shaq would have a platinum and gold album by 1995, his music wasn't getting the best reviews and the reviews really wouldn't get better over time. Shaq would end up releasing his third album, You Can't Stop the Rain, in November of 1996 under Interscope with him previously being on Jive Records. Shaq would follow this up by dropping what is now his last album to date, which is Respect, which he released in September of 1998. After the Respect album, Shaq would take a break from music for a few years. At the turn of the millennium, Shaq began building anticipation for a new album that he was working on. He would tell the Source magazine that the album was going to be revolutionary and that he wanted to bring together all genres. He really wanted to challenge himself on all levels as an MC, writer, and producer with this project. The new album would be called Shaquille O'Neal Presents His Super Friends. The reason behind this title is that Shaq wanted to feature his super friends on the album with artists set to appear such as Black Thought, Quest Love, 112, Ludacris, Nate Dogg, Common, Most Def, Trina, George Clinton, Snoop Dogg, and many more. During the making of this album, Shaq was also trying to get the likes of Pink and Limp Bizkit in which they didn't appear on the album. Speaking on his upcoming album at the time, Shaq would explain, When I decided to record this album, I wanted to make it a collaboration of various styles of rap and voices of thought. I wanted to include talented artists both mainstream and underground. I wanted to celebrate the essence and energy of rap that is created by people from different walks of life. I like the mainstream MCs with their jiggy style and the underground MCs who speak conscious rap. With this album, Shaq really wanted to show people that he was way more than a basketball player. He wanted to explore every part of his life and pursue all of his desires. Shaq would also no longer be with Interscope Records and would be releasing this album through Trauma Records joint venture with Shaq's own imprint label. Shaquille O'Neal Presents His Super Friends Volume 1 was originally set to release on 9 11 in 2001, but it was pushed back until October of that year. The only official single that was released and got a music video was the song Connected, which featured Dub C and Nate Dogg. Promotional singles were given out to music critics to help build up the hype for the project. Some critics cited that the music itself was ambitious and impressive, but considered Shaq's rapping to be mediocre. October of 2001 then came about and the album didn't release and got shelved 
for unknown reasons. So unreleased the album became and a lot of the songs that were slated for the album ended up getting leaked. You can easily hear 53 minutes of the album on YouTube. However, according to the Lost Media Wiki, some of the tracks are unattainable and will probably never see an official release. There is one reviewer who got the chance to listen to the entire album and gave it a 4 out of 5 star rating saying that the album was surprisingly impressive. It's noted that this critic has been forbidden to leak any of it and bootlegs of the album are not known to exist. The last thing that the Lost Media Wiki says is that in 2017, a promotional copy of the album simply titled Shaq was sold on Discogs for 999 US dollars. This copy contained a slightly different track lineup to the final album but still included many of the previously unreleased songs. The full promo of the album containing 14 songs was leaked in 2021 and can now be easily found online as I mentioned earlier. Previously before that leak, a 6 minute video containing short samples of all the songs had been uploaded to YouTube by a user named K-Dub. So now you might be wondering what songs are lost or went unreleased. Some people may know that in 2001, Shaq performed a rendition of the classic rock bass and DJ Easy Rock's Platinum 1988 hit It Takes Two at the Los Angeles Lakers back-to-back -back championship victory parade in front of the at the time Los Angeles Staples Center. The song was scheduled to be a part of the album but according to the track listing on multiple different sources the track ended up being cut from the final version of the project. Other tracks that got cut from the final version are I Don't Give an F featuring the Lady of Rage and You To Be Lying featuring Peter guns. There are songs that made the final track list that are lost and or unreleased. There are two songs that really stuck out to me, which one of them being That's Me, which allegedly was produced and featured Dr. Dre. The other song is Atomic Dog, which featured Snoop Dogg and George Clinton. There are a couple more songs, but those are the most notable, at least for this video. In conclusion, this album is partially lost and it's unclear if we'll ever hear the full album in its entirety. This is Eminem's second entry into the series, with his first being when I talked about the lost version of Eminem's song Stan in Volume 3. But this is another entry that I got from the Lost Media Wiki. The story behind this is that in 2003, Eminem had his sights on video games. He already had a very successful rap career and an award-winning movie under his belt, with that being 8 Mile, which was released the previous year. Eminem had inked a deal with Conspiracy Entertainment, which was a third party developer video game publisher. They published games from smaller companies that would face difficulties distributing games themselves. The company would secure the rights to publish interactive properties across multiple platforms featuring Eminem. The first title under this belt that was supposed to release was a video game called Mixed TV Presents Eminem. This was set to be the first game in a line of fan appreciation titles that Conspiracy Entertainment planned to do under the Mixed TV brand. Brand. The company wanted to position this brand as a fan appreciation product. The game features four music videos, including the song My Name Is and The Real Slim Shady, as well as bonus features and interactive elements featuring Eminem. Conspiracy Entertainment planned to ship both a teen rated version of the game, which would have radio edit versions of the songs and a mature rated version with the uncut material. One or two people could play Mixed TV Presents Eminem, either doing the co op or competitive mode. The objective of the game was to unscramble puzzles formed from the game's four videos before the song concludes. There were six different types of puzzle modes in the game, including a memory match mode and sliding puzzles mode. The game was scheduled to ship in the early summer of 2003 on the PlayStation 1 and PC for $14.99 or less. Mixed TV Presents Eminem was expected to be the first game in a new brand of titles using proprietary technology that scrambles full motion video into various puzzles. In addition to this game, Conspiracy Entertainment collaborated with Eminem on ideas for the first next generation video game under the deal. One of the ideas for this next game was to possibly turn the Slim Shady Show animated cartoon into a 3D action video game in time for a release in late 2004. The Mixed 
Twitch TV Presents Eminem game was expected to debut in May of 2003 at E3 in Los Angeles. For those who don't know what E3 is, it's the largest gaming expo of the year and a chance for the biggest names in gaming to show off their new consoles and games and to set the bar for the rest of the industry. So this was the time to show off the game, but this never happened to my knowledge. Trouble would arise because two months after E3 in July of 2003, Eminem would be accused by Conspiracy Entertainment of bailing on their video game deal. The company claimed that Eminem signed a deal with them in February of 2003, and they believed that Eminem's representatives pulled out of this deal to work with a bigger company. Conspiracy would ask for $5 million in damages. We were not aware of any problems until we started getting some press on our new product. Then we started hearing rumors about Eminem negotiating a better deal with Rockstar Games or some other big video game publisher. Apparently our deal must have been in the way because there was no other reason for Bravado and Cousins to stop us from introducing a video game that was approved before the contract ever got signed. Cousins refers to Cousins Entertainment which was Eminem management company and Bravado being Bravado International Group which was Eminem's licensing agent. I'm unsure of what was the result of this lawsuit but because of everything that went on the game never came out and according to the Lost Media Wiki the game is lost. Not really a surprise but honestly if I'm being real the game sounds like absolute trash and sounds really boring to me so in my opinion it might be a good thing that it never came out when it was supposed to but in 2023 it would still be interesting to see what what the game could have looked like and what the future Eminem games could have been. However, this segment doesn't end here because there is another fully lost Eminem game, but this time it's an iPhone game. In 2009, Eminem would release the album Relapse. This was a big deal because this would serve as Eminem's return to original material since his 2004 album Encore. Relapse was released in May of 2009 and right before the album's release, Eminem would announce the game on his Twitter and post a screenshot of the album on his Twitter which went on to be titled Relapse Resistance. This was supposed to come out the same month as the album release. Some information about this game is that it was set to be priced at $2.99 upon release. The game was developed by DS Media Labs, who according to their LinkedIn profile, are a global leader in mobile strategy, design, and development. It was done by DS Media Labs in conjunction with Shady Games. I found a Facebook post that DS Media Labs made about the game in 2009. They would state that in Relapse Resistance, you assume the role of Eminem as he fights his way out of I think it's Pop Some Hills, the rehab center that he was remanded to. Insane patients, orderlies, and nurses will stop at nothing to see that Eminem never makes it out alive. Use the weapons at your disposal to keep the mobs back. Use your fist, pistol, or machine gun to fight off the waves of enemies. There is actual gameplay online of the game. I searched on YouTube and I came across two videos. One of the videos is from a YouTuber named Touch Them Apples who posted a review of the game in late June of 2009. He gave the game a 7 out of 10 and also said that it was 99 cents in the description. Also in the description, the YouTuber thanked a guy named Matt from DS Media Labs for sending him a promo code to play the game. From what I've seen, the game was available on the App Store for a little while before it was taken off. People attribute this to how violent the game was and people would have been surprised if the game got through Apple's approval process. It should also be noted that around this time, Nine Inch Nails were having problems problems with Apple as well because of their app. To fill you in a little bit, Nine Inch Nails had an app, but in May of 2009, Apple refused to approve the Nine Inch Nails latest iPhone app update. The reason why is because according to Apple, the update contained objectionable content. This objectionable content that they were referring to was their 1994 album, The Downward Spiral. People have classified Relapse Resistance as fully lost. And just like that, we come to the end of the video today. All in all, let me know what you guys thought of the video. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.